One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hello, test. One, two, three. Test. Please rise and receive the invocation from Vice President Taylor. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the night's rest and this new day and with all the opportunities that it affords us. As we come together on this occasion, we would pause at this time to express our thanks to thee for all of the blessings that thou hast so graciously bestowed upon us. And we would pray that thou would watch over us and guide us in our deliberations here this day. We thank thee for all of these people that have been able to come and be here at this place at this time. And we trust that out of this conference, out of this meeting together, great and lasting good will accrue not only to us, but to the various families that are represented and to all of the working people and to all of the people of our great state. We trust the deliberations will be beneficial, that the problems that come before us will be solved in a manner that will be pleasing and acceptable to thee, and that we will approach all of our problems in the spirit of brotherhood, kindness, and goodwill for each other. Guide us and direct us through all of the activities of the day and we will give thee the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. In behalf of the officers of the Mississippi FLCRO, we want to say we appreciate very much the good turnout we have here this morning and we hope that uh, before you leave here that you will feel that your trip has been beneficial. I'm sure that <clears throat> everyone present uh, this morning recognizes the fact that that our state is faced with some more serious problems and that is a group of responsible citizens the members of our organization will make their contribution towards helping solve those problems. Most of you, as most of you know, the Fair Employment Section of the 1964 Civil Rights Act will go into effect on July the 2nd. <clears throat> we felt, as responsible officers of the organization, that we should call a conference of our officers of our locals, bring in some people, some staff people, some experienced people, and review this particular section of the law for the officers of our local unions. Unfortunately, <coughs> one of our panelists will not be here until about noon. Bill McSorley with the Building Trades uh, organization will not be here till the afternoon session. We had hoped to arrange the program in such a fashion that we could tie Mr. Liebes's discussion in with the discussion on Section 7 because the, the facts are all related. We have <coughs> the Regional Director, Mr. Liebes from New Orleans, the National Labor Relations Board with us this morning. And to kick the program off, I've asked him to review several recent decisions of the National Labor Relations Board relating to racial discrimination. He'll deal with this subject in several different ways, several different situations. And after Mr. Levis has made his presentation, our CARA on the Civil Rights, with the Civil Rights Department of the FLCIO will then review Section 7 of the Act with you. Then we hope to have a question and answer session. So in the course of the 
discussion this morning, I would suggest that you make some notes if you have some questions in your mind that you'd like to have cleared up. So with these few remarks, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to you this morning Mr. John Liebes of the National Labor Relations Board. Mr. Liebes. Thank you, Brother Ramsey. Mr. Taylor, Mr. Kerr, and might I just say friends. Uh, on my way up here from New Orleans, <clears throat> I wasn't aware of the exact renovation that we had undertaken in this hotel from several years ago when I was here visiting with you but it's many improvements, one of which I noticed is an escalator going to the second floor. Well, this more or less put me to mind of our so-called uh, emphasis on automation these days that we hear so much about all around us. But having grown up at a small town as a country boy and had the pleasure of barefooted, kicking a stone down a dusty road, I got a quick comparison of how it would be if I stood at the top of this escalator and tried to do the same thing. But I found it would be very helpful and convenient. I could always wait till the stone came back up. I wouldn't have to chase it. But I was more impressed by the automation when the fact was I was riding halfway up when Gene Cox said, say, come here. Well, here I am caught up in this automation and I can't go back down, so I'm up here. It's been a real pleasure to anticipate coming here on my previous times, occasions. It's been a real privilege and a pleasure to discuss with you our procedures, the act, and our functions with the National Labor Relations Board. As you know, we have the 15th Regional Office in New Orleans, and we have the states of Louisiana and half of the state of Mississippi south of Jackson, including Jackson and South. And then have the southern, west, southwestern portion of Alabama and the northwestern portion of Florida. We even get up into Columbus, used to at least, and we see some of our friends from up there. <coughs> I want to just briefly discuss with you some of the aspects of the act and its impact on race and racial discrimination problems. I want to go right into this subject because I see that you've got a pretty full day here. And then if, as Mr. Ramsey has indicated, there are questions, we can get to those later. Well, one thing, uh, since you're gonna discuss Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, I think I should say at the outset that the National Labor Relations Board is not the agency <coughs> to enforce any part of the Civil Rights Act or Title VII. Now there have been some pronouncements by speakers over the country to the effect that we would administer or enforce Title VII of the Act. Well now, the passage of the Civil Rights Act does not in any way change directly our authority or our jurisdiction. There's no redefinition, redefinition of the National Labor Relations Act under the Civil Rights Act. Now, for several years in the past, and particularly during 1962, there were several decisions by our board having to do with racial relations. And they've continued to date based upon some of those earlier decisions. And it's these I'd like to talk about. I think there will be an increase in the type of program or type of activity which our agency will undertake because of the Civil Rights Act, but I think it will be indirect, and I might explain that later. Right now, uh, briefly stated, there are about five ways which we get into the area of racial discrimination or racial matters having to do with our act. Number one would be an issue of whether the contract is a bar to processing a petition for an election. 
Uh, number two would be the ruling on objections to elections. Number three, under our act, what constitutes concerted activity whenever you have an intermingling of labor relations and race relations? The number four would be ruling on the revocation of certifications. And number five would be the determination of unfair labor practices having to do with racial relations or contracts affecting minority groups. Well now, without naming the decisions, many years ago, the issue of whether or not a certified union divided itself into two groups, Negro and white, pursuant to that certification, and thereafter entered into contracts, the board said <coughs> that this is not a matter over which we would say constitutes sufficient to revoke a certification. I don't believe they've said that yet, but they have modified their decisions and they have explained this position of theirs this way. Now in Pioneer Bus, for example, which was one of the earlier decisions modifying this position, which they've had for many years, which was in December 1962. We had a situation about like this. A union was certified as a bargaining representative. This was a Houston, Texas case. And a, another union filed a petition for an election. Well, the contracting union or the certified union intervened and says our contract constitutes a bar, therefore there can be no election. Well, upon investigation it was determined that not only had the union organized itself into two groups, it had set up two contracts, one comprised of a group of Negroes and another a group of white. And these two contracts applied separately to these two groups. Now the board says that these contracts will not constitute a bar to prior proceeding on another election because they are separate and they're separate along clear racial lines. And now what do we mean by this? In other words, the working conditions, the contract set out separate conditions for whites and separate conditions for colored and the board says this will not constitute a bar, we will direct an election. Now the board also said in this Pioneer Bus case, had we not directed an election, we would revoke our prior certification of this union because it administered the certification in a manner to discriminate against Negroes. I can give any of you the reference to these decisions later if you're interested in the particular holding that we discuss. You know, I'm, I don't think, uh, Claude, it's a direct result of the Civil Rights Act, but it's very pleasing to me to notice that in this meeting today, compared to meetings I've been at before, that the women just appear to be more equal at this meeting than they were before. We're very happy to see more of you here. Now, as to objections to elections, uh, this, there are two, three, four, five cases that I'd like to at least give you some brief description of. Uh, we've been discussing these among ourselves, and perhaps you have no doubt had reference to them in your reading. But you may have some questions about them later. In the Sewell Manufacturing Company case, which was decided on August 1962, the board reviewed its position and reconsidered what it should do whenever the race issue had been injected into a campaign prior to an election. Prior to this election, 
the employer conducted an intensive campaign <coughs> on matters of race and of integration. It published various pictures of white men dancing with Negro women and vice versa. On the one picture was the heading, Race Mixing is an Issue as Vickers Workers Ballot. Various other strong references were made in repeated propaganda about unions contributing to the NAACP, NAACP, and other civil rights groups. The board set aside the election, which the union lost, and directed a new election. Now, I'd like just to read you some of the holding in this decision because it's language which I couldn't repeat just by explaining it to you. The board explained its function with respect to the race issue in campaigns for elections in this case. The board said, our function as we see it is to conduct elections in which the employees have the opportunity to cast their ballots for or against a labor organization in an atmosphere conducive to the sober and informed exercise of the franchise, free not only from interference, restraint, or coercion violative of the act, but also from other elements which prevent or impede a reasoned choice. Prejudice based on color is a powerful emotional force. We think that a deliberate appeal to such prejudice is not intended or calculated to encourage the reasoning faculty. What we have said indicates our belief that appeals to racial prejudice on matters unrelated to election issues, and I want to underscore this, unrelated to the election issues or to the union's activities, are not mere prattle or puffing or campaigning. They have no place in board electoral campaigns. They inject an element which is destructive of the very purpose of an election. They create conditions which make impossible a sober, informed exercise of the franchise. The board does not intend to tolerate as electoral propaganda appeals or arguments which can have no purpose except to inflame the racial feelings of voters in the election. Now on this same day, in, they issued the decision in Sewell Manufacturing Company case in which the employer had conducted a heavy campaign of hate <coughs> because of the claim that they would be integration. The board also issued another decision called Allen Morrison Sign Company in which the racial issue was injected but in a different manner and in which the board did not set the election aside. So I'd like for you to hear a little bit of what the board said on this occasion. In Morrison Sign, the board dealt with the problem of the alleged injection of extraneous issues of race hatred into the proceedings. The board found that the employer had sent a letter to the employees during the campaign, a part of which read as follows. I have to take a couple more lessons in public speaking. <coughs> Another thing for you to consider, says the employer, is a problem which has existed in the South for many years to which there has been no good answer. That is the question of racial segregation. Whether you believe in segregation or integration of white and colored schools, swimming pools, plants, and other places is a question for you to decide and each person is entitled to his own view. The company desires this a matter for each individual to decide. The national unions, on the other hand, have taken the view that they are supposed to decide the question of segregation or integration, and they have actively promoted integration. 
The letter went on to point out ways in which the unions through court actions and otherwise had tried to end segregation in various aspects of community life. The board ruled that the election in this case should not be set aside. And it stated the following as its reasoning. The employer's own letter was temperate in tone and advised the employees as to certain facts concerning union expenditures to help eliminate segregation. The excerpt from Militant Truth, some of you are probably familiar with that, concerned action taken by the union, in this case, in a nearby city. We are not able to see that, say that the employer, in this case, resorted to inflammatory propaganda on matters in no way related to the choice before the voters. And we therefore decline to set the election aside. Now, the board, in this Sewell case, however, set out that there were certain obligations on the part of the person that injected the race issue into an election campaign. And I'd just like to give you two paragraphs of that. The test will be whether the party making the racial appeal limits itself to setting forth truthfully the other party's position on matters of racial interest and does not deliberately seek to overstress racial feelings by irrelevant inflammatory appeals. The burden will be on the party making use of racial appeal to establish that it was truthful and germane related to the issue. Where there is doubt as to whether the total conduct of the party is within permissible limits, such doubt will be resolved against that party. Now, it seems to me the board is speaking very clearly, very definitely, on this matter of injecting the racial issue into election campaigns. Now, this was turned around the other way in a couple of cases recently in Baltimore in the Archer Laundry Company case and the Aristocrat Lennon or Laundry Company case. And uh, here there was an attempt to organize the laundry workers by a union, but with the open declared help of civil rights groups. And they joined hands in this effort. Most, if not all, of the employees were Negroes, and there was a very strong appeal <coughs> based on racial matter. The employees went to civil rights group meetings, and they sought the help of the civil rights groups to organize the laundry. And the civil rights groups agreed to help. Now, during the campaign prior to the election, the civil rights group and the union jointly distributed circulars. The union won the election, but the employer filed objections based on allegations of the injection of race hate issues in the campaign. And there's no question but what many of the leaflets, besides discussing typical working conditions, also talked about general matters involved in the struggle for civil rights. In this case, the board overruled the company's objections and certified the union. And it made this distinction in Sewell and the other cases. They found that the union did not unduly inject race hate matters into the campaign, but really only appealed to the racial pride of the employees. There was one leaflet <coughs> which had in capital letters at the top, freedom is everyone's fight. Next, 
with a picture of a dog that was a quote, dogs couldn't stop us. Next, with a picture of a policeman standing with a club over a prostrate individual. Quote, police brutality couldn't stop us. Next, with a picture of a fire hydrant, fire hoses couldn't stop us. And then appeared a picture of a rather large individual carrying a club marked boss. And the question, are you going to let your boss stop you? Then at the bottom, a yes vote for the union is a yes vote for freedom. Well, now you can see from these quotes that the civil rights group for the general proposition of freedom had intertwined, and the union intertwined this into the efforts to win the election. Well, the board says that this was permissible under those circumstances and refused to set the election aside and overrule the objections and certify the union. Now, I point these out precisely to say that the board is concerned in connection with the racial matter only to the extent that it relates to the employee's rights under our act and being able to vote in an election free of all of this inflammatory propaganda which appeals to hate. If a union has an announced policy of supporting integration in any community, the employer can permissibly, legally call this to the attention of the voters and say so. It's a fact. So the board is saying it's fine for people to try to promote the proposition of freedom and civil rights and for a union to do so and for a civil rights group to assist them in a campaign to win a labor board election. Now this has been a question in this very city in an election which I ruled upon some time ago. An issue which related to those objections were, was just this, before we ever had these decisions. Uh, probably one of your biggest employers here. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of my, your time. You stop me and cut me off if I am. I'll get interested in this. Just keep talking. You know, since our forefathers took this trek west in these so-called covered wagons and got rich discovering gold, more of them did not than did, I'm told. But never before have we ever been confronted with such serious matters as we are today in our civilization of turning and facing each other, not in the pursuit of gold, but something far more in value and in richness is understanding. And whether we like it or not, and I think we would grow to like it more, this is necessary for our survival. It's been so for a long time. The more we recognize it and approach it with understanding, the better we can all live our lives out in happiness and success. It's most appropriate, I think, that we have this meeting in this particular room because the crowning of our efforts here today will be decorated by all these crowns as we come and go. It's very appropriate, Mr. Ramsey, for us to have our efforts so recognized. I mentioned earlier that the board is concerned about the matter of racial issues related to what we call concerted activity. Now under the act, as you know, our function is to protect employees who engage not just in forming or joining a labor union, but if they also on their own engage in what we call concerted activity. Am I talking loud enough for you to hear or too loud back there? All right? Those on the back roads, that's all right? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Concerted activity, we define, broadly speaking, as a, an effort on a part of a group of employees to better their own working conditions or engage in an act together, two or more, strike, for example, 
over something for their own protection. Not a matter of the union involved at all. Now, in one case, there was an effort on the part of employees to engage in what we call concerted activity in which there was a racial issue involved. And this was the Tanner Motor Livery case. And here was a matter of civil rights picketing. Now, what is the legal situation when you have civil rights picketing? And I want to underscore the next word, intertwine. This is very necessary to add this, intertwine with labor relations picketing. Is this concerted activity? Well, under the circumstances of this Tanner Motor livery, the board said it was. And the board said, we will remedy this situation. Now here, employees picketed in protest against a company racially discriminatory hiring policies and practices. And they were discharged for this picketing. Now this is not the kind of picketing that some of us are aware of that is where there are no employees of a company involved. It's a different kind of this picketing. I think we must define what we're speaking about here very clearly. These were people who were already employees. They engaged in picketing to assist in correcting racial discriminatory hiring policies. Now, the board held that these people were engaged in a protected activity under Section 7 of the Act, and they corrected this practice in ordering the employer not to discharge people for this reason. Now, the board relied upon, in this Tanner Motor livery case, in the, Negro, uh, in the Supreme Court case of new Negro Alliance and Sanitary Grocery Company. Now, I think it's, it's important that we get this definition of what the board bases these decisions on because it doesn't mean, un unless they're present, that uh, the board isn't going to take jurisdiction or inject itself into these racial matters. But it will if these matters are, if these issues are present. I'm not going to read all that decision to you, but I'd like to read one paragraph. There is no justification in the apparent purposes of the express terms of the Act for limiting its definition of labor disputes and cases arising therefrom by excluding those which arise with respect to discrimination in terms and conditions of employment based upon differences of race or color. It's interesting to note that uh, the board has more or less always had this policy ever since I've been with this agency. We can't take any action in a case, however, unless somebody files a charge with our agency. And we go back many years on this issue as to the matter of protecting employees and their concerted activity. And of course, one of their activities is to join former sister labor organization. But the pure definition of concerted activity does not limit itself to this. But if a group of employees take concerted activity to correct an unfair condition, <coughs> then they're protected. Even though one of those unfair conditions may be racial discriminatory practices. Now, I'd like to move on to some more recent decisions of the board having to do with discrimination by labor unions <coughs> and by companies.
with respect to racial matters. In the Hughes Tool Company case, the correct name of this case, if you want to make reference to it, is the Independent Metal Workers Union. Locals numbers one and two. It's found at 147 NLRB number 166, and it's usually referred to by the name of the employer, which is the Hughes Tool Company in Houston. <clears throat> but I think I should preface my discussion of Hughes Tool with this statement. It is a fact that a long time ago, those of you who are familiar with some of the Railway Labor Act holdings by the Supreme Court, remember that <coughs> the Supreme Court ruled in a case called the Steele, S-T-E-L-E, the name of an individual, and the l &N. And it seems that the union and the company had entered into a contract which set up a built-in barrier to Negroes becoming firemen. Steele apparently was qualified, but was refused the opportunity to be a fireman. Now the, this wasn't, uh, I've forgotten the date of this decision, it was 1944, it's been a while ago. A Supreme Court rationale or the basis for their decision in this case forms the basis on which the board makes its present decisions as to the responsibility, as to the duty of a union and an employer to exercise their legal function as the exclusive bargaining agency. Where a union is the exclusive bargaining agency, in other words, it must, in order to function legally, represent all the employees in the appropriate bargaining class or unit. <coughs> it cannot, in representing these people, say, we will not process grievances or applications on race or color. If it refuses to do this, it is not functioning as an exclusive bargaining agency, and if it is shown that this is the reason why the union will not represent an employee for whom they have a contract or for whom they are certified or recognized, it will be in violation of the act. Now, this has been so since 1944. This isn't new. The Labor union is compared to a state legislature or a Congress, shall we say. They must represent all the people. They must do it. However, the board has recently had cases on this issue fairly. They must do it without discrimination as to color or race. And they must not refuse on irrelevant issues. Uh, this is a special word. I try to pronounce it so you, or at least I myself, can say it correctly. And that is this irrelevant or invidious, extraneous issues are the language that the board and the court uses. Now, approaching Hughes Tool, the board divided on this case into a majority opinion and a minority opinion. In Hughes Tool, local number one and local number two, or vice versa, were represent white employees and the other one represented Negro. Now, they made a contract with the company which reserved for white employees most of the better jobs in the plant. 
Among the work classifications from which Negroes were excluded was a machinist. A Negro employee applied for this job, an apprenticeship program, to become qualified as a machinist, and he was turned down. He was asked the union to process his grievance, and the re union refused to take any action. The other union filed charges against the second union. And we got into the matter in that way. Sometimes people who file charges with us find that we don't let go of them until we get the results that the act requires. So I would suggest at this point, if I may, that if, you're, if anyone is filing charges, it becomes a matter of public concern after this, not just a matter of your private wishes. So when you file charges, be prepared to see them through. It would suggest that there not be any charges filed for political strategy purposes, nor for vengeance purposes, nor for reprisal, nor for any other extraneous personal reasons or strategy purposes. Because uh, I just want to mention to you that before a charge may be withdrawn, the Labor Board has to give its permission. Uh, now, the Board in its divided opinion was strictly divided on what part of the act they were going to apply to this particular situation. It wasn't a question of whether they would find a violation or not, it's just a question under what provisions of the act. But we can discuss that in detail later if you wish. There are other cases involving rubber workers, the ILA, and might mention the rubber workers case <coughs> because it's rather novel. In Gadsden, Alabama, the contract between the parties did not provide for discrimination along racial lines, but as a matter of practice. The union functioned in such a way that the Negro employee could not advance into jobs which were designated for white jobs. They could not play on the golf course. They could not use the white restrooms nor showers. The uh, Fair Employment Practice Commission, I think, had recommended to these parties that these conditions be corrected. I think the union and the company promised to do so, but they didn't. So a charge was filed <coughs> with our agency, and we took the case, and we went through with it, and we ordered the union and the company to correct these practices, to discontinue the practice of discriminating against Negroes and the plant by, and I say this is novel, it certainly is, they ordered the union to undertake to bargain with the company on putting into the contract a condition that would assure there be no discrimination. They ordered the parties to discontinue separate facilities in the plant and also access to the golf course. Now this may seem poor far-fetched, but what the board did in this case, they also was very novel, and they said this, the expenditure of money by the company or any employer for the construction of and maintaining separate facilities discourages the prospect or the opportunity for Negro employees to either be hired or to be promoted to better jobs. 
because they concluded that we are beyond the general concept of separate but equal facilities. They found in this case, in Gadsden, that they were not equal. But even if they had been, the board is saying this is not enough. These are conditions of employment. They relate to the earnings of people. They relate to the advancement of people in jobs. Therefore, discontinue not only the discriminatory practices, but discontinue the separate facilities. Now, just the reverse of this, however, almost happened in Houston in the Ham Brewing Company case, which I want to conclude with. We'll go into our seventh inning stretch in just a few minutes. I want to conclude first, and perhaps Mr. Kerr will grant you that relaxation. But in the Ham Brewing Company case, <coughs> the board issued a decision saying that the employee who brought these charges, a Negro man who alleged that he had not only been denied an opportunity for advancement, but he had been refused access to other facilities used by white employees. This man was discharged. The board found that he was discharged for loafing and similar activities, not because of his race, nor not because of his efforts to improve working conditions. The previous company that made beer was taken over by the Ham Brewing Company. I don't know the trade name of the beer. But the Ham Brewing Company set about on its own to correct what it found that had existed before, comparable to what had the, ba the board found existed in Gadsden. So the board says it is not necessary for us to order any remedy in this case. This proves to me that the board is reasonable. It proves to me the board's interest is not that of becoming a civil rights crusading arm. It's trying to reasonably administer the act, but to assure that the parties who have a responsibility under this act, that they don't discriminate in conditions of employment, wages, hours, and working conditions because of race or color. Those who undertake to improve their conditions or if they need improvement, the board's going to be reasonable and to work with them in making the effort to do it without any serious remedial orders. So with that I conclude and Thank you very much for your attention and uh, <laughs> thank you, John. We ask uh, Mr. Liebus to review some of these recent decisions with you because tying the board decisions in with the Section 7 of the Civil Rights Act, I think you'll understand before the day is over that the the matter of race is going to be completely out of the picture as far as uh, labor unions and employers are concerned from here on in. That's the reason we want to review these cases with you. We have, uh, <coughs> I have been advised that some of our people have been misled by some of the extremist groups around the state that uh, we're going to pull out of the FLCIO, we're going to set up some independent organizations and the hell with all of this stuff. The decisions of the board tied in with the Civil Rights Act will make this completely impossible. If these people want to remain in the trade union movement, they're going to have to comply with the law like the rest of us. Now, do we have the coffee ready? We'll take a break now, and we're going to have the coffee served in the back. And when you get your coffee, try to come back to your seat where everybody can get around. Are we giving you this coffee for that? We have with us this morning gentleman who should be no stranger to most of you. He served as regional director for the International Lady Garment Workers Union, headquartered in Atlanta for a number of years. He 
matter of fact, he was on our program at our last convention. Since that convention, he's left the Lady Garment Workers Union and taken an assignment with the Civil Rights Department of the FFL-CIO, who has now uh, opened up an office in the city of Atlanta. Brother Kara has probably one of the toughest jobs uh, in the labor movement. I don't quite understand why he left such a good job to take on the one that he's got. But he will review with you this morning Section 7, Title 7 of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which goes into effect on July the 2nd, as we've mentioned already. And without any other ado, it gives me pleasure this morning, great pleasure, to introduce to you Brother Carroll of the Civil Rights Department. Brother Carroll. Thank you, Claude. And it's fine to be here in Jackson with such a fine turnout on such a beautiful fishing morning as we have here today. It might be uh, appropriate to start off my discussion this morning to uh, cite at least one reason why I did take this job, Claude. Most people, uh, including my wife, say that I jumped from the frying pan into the fire, uh, and that is true in a sense. But after many years of organizing throughout the South and <coughs> conducting uh, numerous strikes and going through innumerable labor board proceedings and court cases and, and uh, standing back finally and, and estimating what kind of job we had done in our jurisdiction, I became personally convinced that one of the major bottlenecks to organization uh, and to progress generally in the South was the, our inability to cope with and to wrestle with and to settle this issue of what has come to be called civil rights. That uh, not only in organizing campaigns, not only in, in uh, strikes did we face the problem of the employer and the power structure of the community using the race issue uh, against us if we were organizing Negro workers uh, to turn the whites against us, if we were organizing whites to turn the Negroes against us. And that this problem prevailed throughout the entire, uh, all of our life, that we were so preoccupied, each of us in this region, with this question of civil rights uh, and the politicians wouldn't let us forget it, and the Clarion Ledger wouldn't let us forget it, and a few others wouldn't let us forget it. So that uh, it seemed to me that we had to make a major effort. Somebody had to get to work inside the labor movement to spend all of their time working on this very, very difficult, very sensitive, very crucial area of our life. And this really was the fundamental reason why I accepted the challenge. Now, I'd still be, you may still think I'm crazy, but uh, this is the reason I did it. Now, let me make a couple of other preliminary remarks before we get down to try to understand what the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 says. First of all, I want to refer back to something that John Liebes said. And that is the area of jurisdiction between the National Labor Relations Board and the new agency which is being created under Title VII. Their jurisdictions are different. The work of the Labor Board is not diminished nor changed in any way. Uh, there is going to be an area of, of uh, gathering experience under the new act which may reflect itself in uh, the work of the labor board <coughs> but it is not a substitute it does not in any way change the the basic jurisdiction and work of the labor board and as a matter of fact uh, 
when title seven becomes effective i'm confident that our organizations well from time to time follow both routes if they are having a problem with an employer uh... in an organizing situation they may very well choose to uh... go to the commission under title seven simultaneously go to the labor board so far as the uh... labor board aspects of the case may be concerned so they do not they do not conflict with each other they do not uh... there's no question of, of one replacing the other so far as the future is concerned as a matter of fact you must be careful uh... because the civil rights act does set uh... a, a uh, standard a jurisdictional standard somewhat different from the labor board uh... the civil rights act for example says that the employer and the union shall be covered if they reach certain numbers of persons the law as of july the second will cover all employers and unions with one hundred employees or more this is a different kind of a standard than the labor board has applied uh... for interstate commerce uh... whether or not they they can uh... exercise jurisdiction over a particular employer or union so that uh... There are these differences uh, between them, and we'll get into those more in just a moment. Uh, now, John, you made one other reference, and that was to the uh, fact that we have such a large contingent of women here today. Uh, well, first of all, women in the Mississippi labor movement have always been very active, uh, and so it's no surprise from that standpoint. But they have they come here today, too, to find out what the act says about them because this law uh, for some strange reason I guess the men were asleep at the switch when this happened uh, up there in Washington but the law title 7 says there shall be no discrimination because of race color creed sex or national origin and some of the most interesting discussions and speculations have been taking place not about the race issue or, or how it affects it but what happens with the sex question uh, come July the 2nd? Now, we are all very much in favor of them, uh, the female sex, that is. Uh, <laughs> but the new commission is going to have its hands full in trying to interpret what it's supposed to do about equality of the sexes. I've been convinced myself personally that the big mistake we made was in ever giving women the right to vote to begin with but uh, uh, and we now see the ultimate end to this particular problem I, I must say on a couple of occasions I've scared some of my building tradesmen friends by uh, having them consider uh, what it's going to, life is going to be like with uh, having female iron workers up on these tall buildings and and female plumbers and female electricians and a few others and it scared them pretty badly I must say to, to consider well, that that is the additional reason why you have such a large group of women here I could talk at length about the the general posture of the labor movement with regard to this act uh, how our what our attitudes are and just let me before I plunge into a detailed analysis, point out something to you. It is possible, and many of our people are doing it, it is possible to take the position that this does not really apply to us, that somehow if I run away from it hard enough, somehow if I hide uh, my head, that this is going to pass by and be forgotten and not affect me. It is possible also to say, well, that nasty uh, national AFL-CIO has got us here in Mississippi into this kind of a uh, mess. Uh, we're going to pull out of the AFL-CIO and go independent. Uh, the only thing I must call to your attention is the fact that this law covers all of us. It covers employers organized employers and unorganized employers 
It covers labor organizations, whether affiliated or unaffiliated. And the, there is no escape in that sense from uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And I've had a, a few, not many, but a few people say, well, if this is what we're faced with, I will uh, simply exercise my rights uh, under a right to work and, and stop paying dues to my union. And I have to tell you that if you do that, and if you're concerned about the fact that you may, uh, the union may be uh, working out this problem in some kind of a systematic sound way in the, inside the framework of the contract, that that plant or that shop or that job is still covered by the act, whether you're not you're paying dues to, to uh, a particular labor organization. And unless you decide that you're going to go out to uh, some remote island in the Pacific Ocean and escape the world, period, uh, there is no particular profit in that course of action. I wanted to say this in advance because uh, there have been rumblings around to this effect. I had one business agent ask me, well, can't I, can't I uh, uh, dissolve my local union and become a private club? Uh, and I had to tell him uh, that the law defines what a trade union is, and even if he calls himself a private club, he is still a trade union, whether he likes it or not. So that uh, there is no relief to be found in that kind. And you know, our labor people can be quite uh, ingenious about uh, these things, and, and uh, as the labor board well knows, uh, we, we find for new approaches. My own feeling is that we will all profit, the region will profit, the labor movement will profit if we take a positive head-on position with regard to this and uh, work out as fellow trade unionists our basic commitment to each other to improve our lot in life through our organization, through the National AFL-CIO, and through the Mississippi AFL-CIO. So much for the general uh, uh, proposition. As I indicated earlier, this title uh, covers, as of July 2nd, 1965, employers and unions with 100 employees or more. In 1966, that number drops to 75, in 1967 to 50, and finally in 1968 to 25. How do you count employees? Not just those in the bargaining unit. You count all people working on the payroll of that particular company. What constitutes an employee? The law says that you count the number so far as uh, whether this affects the particular union or the particular uh, company, if the records show that in the previous calendar year you had 100 workers for each day for 20 calendar weeks. It's a fairly simple standard and is can be verified easily by record. The same thing would apply for a union as to whether or not uh, they had that many members for that many weeks during the course of the year. Now the law says that it shall be an unfair employment practice for an employer, and mind you this, this is particularly uh, outside of the building trades in this state at least, this applies uh, most basically to the employers. The law says it's, it's illegal to fail or refuse to hire or to discharge any individual, or otherwise to discriminate against any individual with respect to his compensation, terms, conditions, or privileges of employment because of such individual's race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Second, to limit, segregate, or classify his employees in any way which would deprive or tend to deprive any individual of employment opportunities or otherwise adversely affect his status as an employee 
because of such individuals race color religion sex or national origin the law goes on to say that employment agencies are covered and they cannot refuse to us to recommend or refer for employment on any of these five categories and what's it say about a union says the following it shall be unlawful for a union to exclude or to expel from its membership or otherwise to discriminate against any individual because of his race color religion sex or national origin or to limit segregate or classify its membership or to classify or refuse, fail or refuse to refer for employment any individual which would tend to deprive that individual of employment opportunities. Or to cause or attempt to cause an employer to discriminate against an individual in violation of this section. Uh, this last was put in to cover the situation in which the contract and the Constitution, all the legal documents may be in order, but there is a common understanding a verbal understanding between uh, the employer and the union or it's his employees that there shall be practiced uh, some sort of discrimination. The law also covers apprenticeship training and wherever there is an employer, labor organization, joint labor management committee controlling apprenticeship or other training or retraining including on the job training programs to discriminate because of his race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Now, let me pause at this point to, to point out an exemption which the law states, and that is what has come to be called the religious exemption, where there is an organization, uh, let's uh, take a, let's say a Catholic monastery, for example, uh, the law does not require there that they hire a non-Catholic to work in that particular monastery. Or, uh, let me give you a different example, uh, the law would not require the Jewish uh, uh, synagogue to hire a non-Jew to prepare kosher, the kosher meat, for example. In other words, it's, uh, the law is trying to say practically that, that where religion is a basic integral part of the, the uh, of job or the work or the, the uh, company or whatever it is that uh, this section does not apply in those circumstances. Now, there are three aspects of this law which are exceedingly important, which have bothered our people, uh, there, which there's been a great deal of confusion, which I want to point out at this time. First of all, one of the things that was said about the, this section was that it was going to destroy our seniority system that we have worked so hard to attain. Secondly, that it was going to destroy the whole idea of work standards and craft standards and job standards which we have developed down through the years. Neither of these things is true. The law simply says that a bona fide seniority system which does not discriminate because of race, color, creed, sex, or national origin is perfectly all right. There is no, and this applies to the overwhelming majority of cases. In other words, the law does not attempt to, to get into the question of whatever prevailing practice you have under your agreement, so long as it is not operating to discriminate against these five basic categories. Also, the st so far as standards are concerned, the law quite clearly states that the employer, who in most cases sets the standards, can do so. He can use whatever system for, for setting up those standards. He can use whatever uh, sound aptitude tests or qualifications tests, as in the past, provided they are not rigged to discriminate against these five basic categories. Now, if you have a, an aptitude test, for example, which many companies are now using more and more, uh, 
the test is what are the practical results if it can be shown that the effect of this aptitude test is to exclude someone because of his race or someone because of her sex, then uh, obviously the, the, no matter how loud we protest, if the standard is a sound one, it can be disputed under this particular section of the law. Also at, at issue here is whether or not the, the standards are reasonable standards. I've had a lot of experience in the past few months in the paper industry. A number of companies are going about putting in standards now uh, for their jobs, which are, uh, to our view, uh, for all practical purposes, going to be in violation of, of this section and will, be, will probably be challenged on this basis. But they are requiring for, for the lowest entrance into the plant, uh, into the mill, uh, such high qualifications that I'm told at least in one case I'm familiar with that the superintendent of the plant himself would fail the test if he were to dare to take it. That uh, they're requiring standards way in, uh, out of sight so far as their argument is that uh, we want to hire only people who are potential presidents of, of the company. And of course this is nonsense because there's only room for one guy at the top and we all know that that most of us are going to be in the uh, basic production unit of that throughout our entire lives. The other thing which I want to call your attention to, and this I want to direct uh, primarily to our Negro delegates here, this, uh, there have been a number of cases arising in the past and many disputes over, over this question, and that is, the argument is made that there has been previous discrimination, which we all are aware of. Therefore, what we need now is preferential treatment. What we need now is to make up for the hundred years of, of uh, discrimination. Uh, the law does not provide any relief to this problem. As a matter of fact, the law says just the opposite that there shall be no preferential treatment because of race, color, creed, sex, or national origin. It becomes a violation of the law if the employer or the union should try to, to give preferential treatment in an effort to create a better balance, perhaps between the races or between the sexes, uh, or uh, in any way <coughs> discriminate in favor of one of these categories. So that this is important to bear in mind that the law does not uh, permit preferential treatment, nor does the law permit quotas. And I want to make sure that you clearly understand this because in the whole history of the legislation, the rumor got going that there was going, this law was going to require a quota system. Some of you may recall we discussed this at the Gulfport uh, Labor School a couple months ago. Uh, I was told then by some of the students that, well, this law says that for every 25 white workers, there should be one Negro worker. And I said, where'd you get that from? They said, well, this is what it says. And I must tell you that the law prohibits quotas of any type for these reasons. It prohibits it that you cannot quota jobs. Now, if you will look around you, and particularly in the non-union uh, sector of industry in Mississippi and throughout the South, the strategy among the non-union employers is to do precisely this. In advance of the law, many Mississippi employers that I'm familiar with have created quotas all of their own. Now they won't admit this publicly, they don't talk about it as a quota, but they are building into their employment now so many Negroes so that if there's ever a test they can say, well we are in fact in compliance because we have this many Negroes. They are building in also showcase people so that they can point and say, well we don't discriminate, there we have one Negro, there we have one Negro, this kind of thing. And 
uh, they will find, I'm confident, that uh, when challenges are made to this type of quota, that they will have to give up this kind of practice. I might say, just as a footnote here, that there's another motive with most of the non-union employers, and that motive is one that, that is not spoken about publicly whatsoever, but if you look carefully at the situation, you will you'll see what's involved here, that Negroes are being employed in many of the non-union plants at a definite ratio for the purpose of creating a balance in that plant so that when the union organizer comes around, he's got a built-in case against the union. If the union should go to the Negro group, he turns to the whites and says, see, that, that, that lousy union is uh, uh, catering to the Negro group. If he goes to the, to the whites, he'll say to the, to the Negro group, see, that is a lily white union. And it is an effort on the part of many of our employers to take, seize hold of, of this section of the act, built in a permanent kind of situation which will be controllable from the standpoint of union organization. And if you will examine also, what they are doing is hiring a screening man, uh, an Uncle Tom, if you will, who carefully selects the Negro employees for their docility and for their, their, their ability to be exploited by this particular employer. And this is as a footnote, but this is one of our most serious challenges in the labor movement in the South, uh, not to be taken in by this kind of uh, approach by the employers. That footnote was as a labor organizer, not as a, as a civil rights area director, by the way, because I see this as one of our big problems that, that's coming in. Now, the law sets up a commission, a five-man commission. Uh, most of you probably have read who uh, is now going to chair the, this commission. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Jr. is the chairman. It is a bipartisan commission three Democrats and two Republicans. Uh, it has on it a native Mississippian who uh, is now the chairman of the Texas Civil Rights Advisory Commission. It has on it a, a uh, female uh, union organizer, ex-organizer, uh, came out of the garment industry, uh, has a lawyer and a professor also on this commission. The commission's job is, and here is another distinction between uh, this section of the law and the labor board, the commission's job is not a uh, evidence-taking, ruling kind of, of body. It, its job is to, when it receives a complaint, its job is to conciliate and to mediate, and to try to resolve the, the problem on an informal basis. As a matter of fact, the law specifically says that they are to keep no public, there are no records which are, can, are to be used in any kind of court case or anything of that kind. So that they are a mediation uh, type of body in contrast to the labor board with which you are all familiar. Its job is to uh, take complaints and its job is also to to set forth in great detail, as great a detail as necessary, the rules and regulations by which we will all be operating under this title of the Act. It will spell out, for example, in its regulations, whether there are any exemptions to this sex question so far as women's jobs are concerned. Are there jobs which are excluded from the Act because of the nature of the work? Uh, is it necessary that a uh, an employer who wants to hire an attractive female secretary now has to hire a male secretary if he applies. Uh, this is the kind of thing they're going to have to decide. It's an important question, by the way, if any of you have secretaries. Uh, does a, a shipping line have to take uh, oilers and firemen from the female sex? 
these rules will have to be determined by this commission uh, as to whether or not uh, these standards uh, apply, because the law does not spell it out. Also, the commission is given the job of keeping records. They, you'll all be, be confronted with this in your local union and in your plant where the commission will have uh, periodically records that you'll have to fill out showing the uh, situation so far as these five categories are concerned, uh, what the racial situation is, what the sex situation is, that kind of thing. So it has two jobs. It's a, rec it's a record compiling, keeping kind of agency. It's also a conciliating and mediating service. Now let me spend here in, in just a few moments the last of what the law attempts to do. That's, it sets out the rules by which a complaint shall be made under this title of the act. The law says that the, an individual who feels that he or she has been discriminated because of these five categories, race, color, creed, sex, or national origin, shall file a written affidavit with the commission within 90 days of the event which they claim is, is discriminatory, within 90 days. This is going to be an important consideration because uh, it is a relatively short period of time in which to file following a particular event. Secondly, the commission has 30 days with which to investigate and attempt to mediate the problem. It provides an additional 30 days where they can show that there is some reasonable expectation that additional time will, in fact, provide for a solution. But they have to act promptly. There will not be long, drawn-out delays. Uh, sometimes I wish the National Labor Relations Board had this kind of a, a rule. But it, it is, I think, going to make for a relatively speedy kind of disposition or movement, at least, on many of these problems. Now, if the problem cannot be resolved by this informal method, then the individual is free to go to federal district court and file a lawsuit uh, at that court. The law provides that where the complainant can show that he or she does not have the wherewithal to pay an attorney for this suit, that the court shall appoint an attorney to take care of this problem and to pay the, the court costs that are involved. Now, we are hopeful, of course, that there will be overwhelming voluntary compliance and the mediation conciliation system will work. Uh, it will, if it does not work, then, of course, the uh, cases will proceed to court, and the court is given the authority under this title of the act to decide on the basis of the facts as they, they compile the record whatever suitable remedy is involved. This might be to enjoin the uh, employer or the union, this, or the employment agency or the apprenticeship program. This might be uh, to uh, place that person in the job that they're seeking. That might be reinstatement of the job if it can be shown that there was discriminatory discharge. This might be back pay. Whatever, the law simply says, whatever suitable remedy is called for can be applied. And it's a consideration, too, if any of us become involved in lawsuits of this type, uh, and we may find ourselves subjected, uh, if we get ourselves into this position, of being uh, charged with considerable back pay and, and other kinds of uh, expensive remedies. Now, one other aspect of the, the complaint procedure, the Attorney General of the United States 
is also authorized under this section of the act to file with the federal court a, uh, a lawsuit where they find a general broad practice or pattern of discrimination. It does not need to be an individual complaint, but it could cover an entire industry or could cover an entire union or, or a group of unions in a particular area. Uh, that is the uh, third way in which a complaint can be processed under this particular section. I want to, I think, uh, stop at this point. Uh, I recognize that the digesting of this is uh, a, a, there's just so much you can absorb from it, and maybe we can get in the question period some specific examples. I should point out that at this point, the law is, this section is not effective yet. Uh, the, the chances are that because of the length of time the president took in naming the commission that uh, July 2nd will not be uh, really, uh, it's when the law becomes effective, but the rules and regulations will not yet be issued. As I understand it, uh, they haven't even found office space for the commission in Washington yet. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, the law will be effective then, and to this extent, even though the rules are not laid out, there will be some retroactivity involved so far as uh, the law is concerned by the time the whole thing gets into, into motion. Much of what we can say at this point then is not, uh, cannot be as specific as we would like to be because we don't know what the precise, exact rules and regulations uh, under this commission will be. So that if I seem in the question period to, to hedge a little bit, it's because I don't want to mislead you and give you a, an authoritative answer when there is no body of experience or rules to go by yet. So I hope that you will appreciate the fact that some of these things are going to be in the nature of probability or speculation as to what the, the future will bring. Uh, Claude, I, I think we'll pause at this point and, and turn the rostrum back to you. Uh, I want to say that uh, it's always a pleasure to be in Mississippi with so many of my old friends, and, and if we can work with you on any of these problems, we're, we're delighted to do so. My office is at uh, 40 Marietta Street Northwest in Atlanta, and my job is to be available at all levels inside the, the southern region for the uh, whatever help we can afford. So don't hesitate to uh, give us a ring or, or drop us a line if you have something that is troubling you and we could help you on it. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Al. As I mentioned uh, this morning earlier, we had another panelist who was supposed to have been with us, but unfortunately he won't be getting in. He should be getting into the airport about now. <coughs> Bill Mike Sawley with the Bill and Trades Department. We wanted him to deal with this particular area for the benefit of the Bill and Trades Unions represented here today. It might be well, Al, we'll try to have him on it the first thing after lunch. It might be well for those of you that have problems or would have questions directed relating to the Bill and Trades Group, it might be best for you to hold off on those questions till this afternoon. Now, we've got Brother Liebus here who reviewed some recent board decisions earlier, and Brother Kerr de uh, dealing with Section 7. So we will now open the floor up for a question and answer session, and you can direct your questions to either one of these gentlemen in both of the areas discussed. Brother Smith Hart, would you mind getting the mic in the middle aisle over here so we can get it on the record? I'm Ray Smith Hart of the Rebel Workers. I'd like to know if there's any way to circumvent this law uh, under these circumstances. I know what you said, uh, they had to have 100 employees or more. Say that a company had a plant in the north or east, and he had several thousand, he had one down here with 
82 people in it. Would all these people be compiled as, as employees of this company, or would each individual plant be counted? Well, Kerry, you want to get that one? This is one of the areas which uh, we can only uh, make an educated guess about. The law simply says company. It does not say plant or plants or subdivisions of that company. And uh, I may uh, be wrong, but my impression is that uh, the law will cover this company with this many people on its payroll regardless of where that, they may have several plants scattered around. For example, you might have in the communications industry the telephone company. You might have over the state 5,000 people, but they are only two or three in each particular location, long distance operators, for example. Uh, it is my, my judgment that the law would cover that whole company, no matter where they are physically located uh, throughout that particular area. Thank you. Anybody else? Let's get Brother Edwards, then we'll get you next, Ed. Brother E.V. Edwards from Tupelo. I'm E.V. Edwards, Tupelo Central Labor Union, Tupelo, Mississippi. In connection with uh, what Ray was talking about, we have uh, explored the possibilities of organizing a so-called company in North Mississippi. And uh, this company previously had departments. Now we understand that they have dissolved these departments into separate companies. This company has 25 employees. This company has 50 employees. This company has 90 employees, all working under the same roof. But they have different payrolls. The records are kept different. They are paid on separate days of the week. And that's one thing that I'd like to know what, how, how we fit in with the situation of this kind. That's a good one. I think my, my answer would be here, too, that uh, where it can be demonstrated that this really is a simply a changing of hats or changing of names for whatever reason they did it, uh, that it, and there is an integrated uh, production, and this is all related, one, one department to the other, no matter what they call it, that it would be covered under this, this title. Uh, there are going to be some uh, borderline cases, and of course, it will. Uh, nothing happens to this company or to any other company unless there's a complaint made against them. So that uh, this kind of thing would have to be judged on the basis of the particular set of facts in in Tupelo and and or wherever it is, and and be taken from there. It may be that there would be legitimate uh, distinctions drawn here. Uh, and they could make a case out, but I doubt it under the base, on the basis of the facts as you give them that this would uh, exempt them from the provisions of the law. Brother Jolly, you want to Frank? Oh, yeah, you. Levis wants to add something to that. I'd like to just add this from the point of view of the Labor Board with respect to determining whether or not this example that you mentioned <coughs> is one employer or several. We would say, usually, if the labor policy of these separate departments or different companies is the same and is determined from a central source that under our act, for purposes of bargaining, it would constitute, it could constitute a single employer. Okay, uh, Ed Jolly from Meridian has a question. <laughs> We have a grievance present that has been processed in the plant at Flint Coat and Meridian. I'd like to ask a question about I was talking to Brother Levis at first and he referred me to Brother Carey. 
And I think uh, Brother Lever still has to answer me on this. Uh, we have a contract that calls for plant-wide seniority with the department. In the past 24 years, they have had in a part department of this a progressive system, rate bracket progressive system. We have a grievance that come in recently that uh, says that uh, members of the local have been deprived of their seniority rights by this progressive system. We process this grievance up through three steps. The company denied it in all three steps and brought out their reason of denying it and nobody had been deprived of going in it at any time. That they could come up and it had been set up for a program of uh, the man when he reached the top was a let out man that he would know all the jobs of letting out. In this department I'm talking about, they have other jobs that are separate, that are not in this progressive system. And uh, colored boys are on all of them. Some of them are higher than some of them in the progressive system. The uh, grievance was denied all three steps, and a recommendation of the committee at a meeting the other night, uh, they recommended that the grievance did not merit arbitration. The uh, membership voted on it and voted it to accept the committee's recommendations after it was explained with some quite a few bit of discussion. What is our status now? I understand that uh, there's a possibility of maybe a suit against the local and the company now. Now who wants to feel that question? I'm trying to do the right job. I want to know. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you want uh, to take this one. The act hasn't gone into effect yet. It'd be July the 2nd now. Would that apply to the, uh, the act hasn't gone into effect yet, you see, as far as uh, Section 7. Uh, you want to comment on that, Al? I think there's one additional fact that you might want to tell the group here, <coughs> that there has been in existence a, uh, prior to the establishment of this law, a federal contracts committee uh, which has been operating, I believe, in your case. Has talked to us <coughs> recently. Yes. yes, because they do have government contracts mm -hmm. and that there are already in existence regulations uh, and a procedure for filing complaints under that, that group. <coughs> now, when it comes to the question of, of merging seniority lists, or merging locals, or uh, merging uh, job categories, because we have had down through the years jobs which have been traditionally white jobs and jobs which have been traditionally Negro jobs. This, of course, is where the rub comes. And there are already a, a number of cases under this government contracts uh, committee where efforts have been made to make these mergers. Now, on the basis of the facts as you give them, where, there where the record is clear that there, the opportunity does in fact exist to bid into those jobs in the progressive group, then uh, it is my, yes, I might add at the present, there's one that was on the grievance that, that is in the line of progression starting up. Right. Where the, these, these facts are, are true, that is there is no denial and no uh, discrimination and betting into those jobs, then both the President's Committee, the one that's now in existence in Title VII, would give you a clean slate as far as I can see. Now, obviously, there is an argument that can be made that if in the past, although there was no technical uh, uh, bar to these jobs, but the practice was a, an effective bar, then an argument could be made that instead of coming into this progression from the bottom like everybody else does, that you really should go sideways and, and take 
with you, all of your plant seniority uh, into uh, these jobs. The, neither the present regulations under the federal contracts provisions nor Title VII call for that kind of, of uh, decision, however. Uh, the particular progression system, the particular seniority system, gets a clean bill of health if it can be demonstrated that there is no effective bar to any of these categories that I mentioned earlier. So that uh, a complaint may be filed and uh, it'll have to be analyzed on the basis of the, the facts as they exist, but uh, as, as far as what you have told us here, and there is genuine progression without regard to, to race, then I would think that would pretty well settle that particular case. The uh, whether there is any basis for a, a, a claim that the union is not fulfilling its obligations under uh, the Labor Management Act, I don't know. I'm not enough of an expert on that. And, uh, the uh, progressive system is not written up in the contract, but it has been as such for 24 years. That's another point of it. From time to time, members, of course, will make a claim that where you don't take their case through to final arbitration, that you have somehow not bargained on their behalf properly. I was, I was on the receiving end of a few of those cases myself, so I know from personal experience. But ultimately, where it can be shown that you, you operated within the framework of the contract and your constitution and there was no violation of their rights and the decision was made not to arbitrate and it was made uh, fair and square, I think the union comes out all right. Anyway. Mr. Levy said he wanted to comment on it too. Uh, I want to make just this observation. <clears throat> I'm glad to see that Brother Kerr here is learning something we found out a long time ago in an attempt to answer these specific questions. <clears throat> you have to be almost half of a bureaucrat, and that's where your delay comes in, and answer the question on a case-to-case -case basis, because neither he nor our federal agency can say, flat rule, that will apply to all these situations. We're all aware of this. But we would look on this, I think, from the Labor Board as to the system, as to the open-endedness of it from that standpoint. Even the Supreme Court has said that there may be different working conditions applied differently to different people on seniority, hours, and wages, and other matters. But they just say that one of these systems as such, our standards shall not be race. Thank you. Little fella to Mike. Hey, see, this is for a little boy of me. <laughs> uh, I have a question, Mr. Carrot, there, please, sir. Uh, if I understand the position with the AFL-CIO that you're in, uh, in the southern region, has it been similar organizations of this type set up in the north and the east and the west for the uh, surveillance of this particular section seven in the civil rights bill. The FLCIO has a national civil rights department with a staff operating out of Washington. Uh, it was a feeling of many of us and ultimately it was put into effect that because of the seriousness of this particular problem in the South, that it would be better to have someone who lived in the South, who worked in the South, who had an appreciation of the complexities of the problem and could deal with it, rather than to always have to refer back to Washington for guidance and assistance. And uh, that was the, the uh, reason why it was established as a Southern thing. There are no other regional offices of the Civil Rights Department other than the Washington office. Question number two. The uh, Section 7 of the Civil Rights Bill would uh, include nationwide the American Indian, the Mexican, and so forth. Uh, yes, uh, accepting that there is an exemption for reservation Indians. I didn't mention that in my earlier remarks because it's not, uh, uh, doesn't 
affect us particularly, uh, but where there, uh, where there are reservations of Indians and there are special programs for Indians, they are exempted from this provision. In other words, he would, wouldn't come under this particular situation, the Indian. Reservation Indians do not. Others, all others do. Mexicans, uh, Chinese, whoever happen to be. Thank you, sir. Mother Stanley. Contractual language providing for promotions that qualifications being substantially equal, seniority shall govern. A history of collective bargaining and grievance handling of people who there were no questions about their qualifications and they had the seniority and the employer refused to accept women on historically white jobs. An example, a service representative in the commercial department who collects your bills and sells your stretch cords and all that kind of stuff. She bids on a historical man, male job, what historically has been a male job. And the company, not through qualifications or not through the lack of seniority, but they refused to accept her because of the sex barrier. And the union fulfills its obligations under the contract going all the way to arbitration and has an arbitrator uphold the company's right not to cross the sex barrier. Does the grievant then have a claim either with the board or under Title VII? And where does the union fit who has uh, fulfilled all of its contractual obligations? Who wants that one first? <laughs> Well, I'd like to answer part of this. I think you're going to have to have a joint response, both from Mr. Carrer and myself, because I'm only going to touch part of it. Historically, the Labor Board has said, while it has exclusive jurisdiction from Congress on matters concerning this kind, that it is, it is alleged that this person who is filing the grievance is being discriminated against, that this is the issue, we would not as such, enter into the question of whether or not the discrimination was because of sex as such, or as a Negro as such, or China or whatever else, color or race, let me say. We would say, so long as that arbitration proceeding was orderly, so long as that arbitration proceeding was fair, and that the aggrieved employee had notice and representation there if he wanted it, we would say under a policy of ours that the arbitration would stand unless it is, quote, repugnant to the public policy as enunciated in our act. We would not, for example, <coughs> let a arbitration stand that it was so obvious that a person was discriminated against because he was a non-union person, shall we say, or a union person. If the arbitrator refused to rule on this issue, we would go ahead and take it. Now, we would say that the union has a responsibility here as a bargaining agency, as far as we're concerned, to see this through. If they saw it through, then we would say offhand that it probably fulfilled its obligation. Uh, the nature of the discrimination, if it happens to be one, based on, in your example, that of a <coughs> female employee. Yeah, I, as I interpret the legislative history and the function of the commission of the Civil Rights Act, this would fall squarely in their jurisdiction and not ours. Like uh, all I want to know is after we fulfilled our commitment out of the contract as a union where there is no discrimination, nothing mentioned about race or sex or anything in the contract relative to promotions, we've gone all the way to arbitration, does that member then have other recourse? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, because of the 90-day limit on filing, they may, uh, while you're in the arbitration proceeding, already take steps to to uh, go file a complaint with the commission, you see. They, uh, but the claim there would not be directed toward the union. You have, you have fulfilled your obligation under your contract. The claim then would, 
the charge would be against the employer in that case. Uh, very since, uh, easily. I'm trying to figure some way to help these girls get some of these men jobs yeah. that they've been wanting to get. <laughs> uh, the, this also, incidentally, comes back again to the thing I said earlier, that this commission has the job now of setting forth guidelines by which these, uh, particularly in this area of sex, uh, what is a, what was historically and traditionally a man's job uh, no longer is valid in and of itself under this law. Uh, now, if you can demonstrate that by virtue of weight, the, the weight that they have to lift or the type of conditions under which they work, or uh, I said earlier, uh, whether you'd have female firemen and oilers on a ship, it might be that the commission very well will say, uh, we consider the maritime trade to be, because of the special circumstances and living and, and all of that kind of thing, might very well be exclusively a male job. Although I said that once, and then someone said, well, the Russians have, have co-educational ships, and, and uh, why isn't it feasible here? Uh, having sailed myself, uh, it would be a disruptive influence, I think. Uh, maybe a maybe a good one for the one one for the better, but uh, uh, nevertheless, it's that kind of thing which they're going to have to decide whether these jobs are uh, should be excluded because of the special considerations. And I have one of them. I have. Uh, you know, he said, uh, "When do you think you could expect those guidelines?" Of course, this depends on when they set up. I would expect probably by around the first or middle of August. Oh no, uh, they're they're instructed by the law to proceed to set out rules and regulations, and there will be test cases made of the regulations that the that the issue. But I would guess, uh, judging from how our past experience in this, that it probably would be at least the 1st of August before they came out. They have got to be written, and this being a, a vast, uncharted sea, they've got to have to be very careful, and they also have to be approved by the president and, of, and uh, the coordinating committee, which is headed by Vice President Humphrey. So there's some uh, considerable time involved there. I may be even optimistic. It may be closer to September before we get there. You want to comment again, John? May I just uh, note this observation with respect to guidelines and rules and regulations? Uh, the Labor Board is most hopeful that this can be done soon by the Commission. As already indicated here, they probably will file with both the Commission and us in many situations. But I dare say that Mr. Franklin Delano Roosevelt will be able to determine this soon. And somewhere between this point, uh, a young boy and girl were walking home from school. And about six or seven years old. Uh, and they both turned to each other and said, which one of us is the opposite sex? Well, now, between that point and when he issues these decisions, there will be some determination made, I'm sure, about the maritime industry, at least. <laughs> I think you understand why we wanted the, the Labor Board represented here this morning, because there is a question, who's got jurisdiction over what? Eventually, these things put into effect. Brother Goodman. Wayman Goodman's the IUE. Getting back uh, one moment to this question, Mr. Bill Stanley, concerning this case going to arbitration. It seems obvious that uh, we may have areas here of where we normally deal in arbitration with contract provisions whereby this law has, uh, is coming into existence, part of it has already been into existence, of where the actual contract doesn't cover. For an example, the case that Mr. Bill uh, was talking about, maybe his contract provision, there's nothing in there. So the arbitrator would be justly in his right for denying this grievance. 
Likewise, would the union not justly be in its right by not even filing a grievance in the first place, but necessarily bringing this directly to the courts? Prior to filing a grievance and going to uh, arbitration with it. It's going to be a, it's going to be a, a um, thing we'll have to work our way through. For example, most of my agreements just to provide that, that uh, we agreed to follow the procedure in the contract and not go to court, you see, uh, so that the union itself might be in violation of its own agreement with the company if it then said, we'll take this matter directly to the commission or to some outside agency. Uh, but there is a question here of timing, too, that's involved, uh, plus the fact that you raise that the arbitrator may be directed in the agreement itself to limit himself only to the terms and conditions as set forth in that agreement. And if you're arbitrating a, a practice which is outside of the contract, uh, he may, may have all the sympathy in the world for you that you're right, but he can't do anything because of the terms of the agreement. But here, the local union and the individual complainant will have to judge the time and the course of action which they uh, choose to take. Bearing in mind that the, in the first instance, if they proceed under Title VII with some of these problems, that they set into motion simply a conciliatory type of, of uh, uh, situation, which they themselves might better be in a position to do inside their own uh, grievance machinery. Uh, unless the circumstances call for, or seem to call for an outside agency to step in and use their powers of persuasion and whatever other powers they have to, to settle the problem. But it's a, going to be a new set of experiences for everybody, and the best that I can say to you now is that uh, if we meet one year from now, we'll be a lot more wise than we are at the present time about what the actual routes and courses of action should be under them. We have time for about one more question before we recess for lunch. Brother Hunt. I'm Robert Hunt with the United Paper Makers and Paper Workers. I'd uh, like to direct a question at Mr. Brother Lieber there. In reference to uh, ruling, I remember you saying uh, that uh, the board instructed management and labor to enter into negotiations and to ne negotiate a non-discriminatory type clause into the contract. Now, that suggested to me uh, making a civil rights bill or Executive Order 10925, Social Security Act, or the Income Tax Act part of your contract, your labor agreement. And I would like a, a little further detail into this well, that was next to the last case that you referred to. understand you're correctly you're talking about this case we mentioned in Gadsden Alabama involving rubber workers and if the board would say to the parties here you negotiate a certain phase of your contract to eliminate a practice that it might extend itself to putting in the contract a requirement that they put in the contract matters with respect to Social Security and other things wage and hour or other federal statutes is that part of your question? Well, the reason why the board, I believe, ordered this particular remedy was in this particular case. They didn't think they could rely upon the promise of either the union or the company that they would discontinue a practice. They had been given one opportunity before this by the Employment Commission 
Fair Employment Commission to eliminate this type of discrimination. They didn't live up to their promise. So the board says, well, now we think we're going to have to have more in this case than you saying you won't do this. We want to see you take an affirmative step because you're supposed to represent all the people in this unit, and therefore you negotiate with the company a provision that you will discontinue this, to try at least and bargain in good faith. Now, they didn't say you have to write this in the contract because they can't say what you have to write in the contract, but they do say the union must ask for it. The union must attempt in good faith to get it in their contract. But that's only true with respect to the facts of this particular case, and it's limited to this case. It's not the general law at all. See, what you had in this situation is a plant covered by this executive order 10925 that you referred to, which is pretty well, uh, uh, Section 7, as I understand it, pretty well implements this executive order as far as all employers are concerned. And they evidently had a complaint filed for violation of the executive order. That's what it sounds to me like. Well, it is now 12 o'clock. We, I know, have a lot of other questions. We'll have another speaker uh, this afternoon. I know there's a lot of unanswered questions yet, particularly as far as building trade unions are concerned. And we hope uh, Brother Mike Sawley has made it in where we can continue this afternoon. And then we have another phase of the program. We want to go into some of the pending legislation before Congress, 14B in particular. So we'll ask you to be back here promptly at 1.30. to you earlier this morning because of other commitments brother Max Sawley wasn't able to get out of Washington until this morning but he did make it in in order that he could participate in our afternoon session brother Max Sawley is with the building trades department of the FFL CIO in view of the fact that we have particular problems relating to the building trades unions concerning section 7 we felt it would be appropriate to have a representative of that department appear on our panel here today in this discussion. Brother Kerry refrained from going into uh, the aspects of Section 7 relating to building trades uh, in general this morning, keeping in mind that Brother Max Sawley would be with us this afternoon. And of course, we asked the representatives of those unions to refrain from asking questions relating to their problems until Brother Mike Sawyer could be with us. So at this time, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to you Bill Mike Sawyer of the FLCIO Building Trades Department. Thank you, President Ramsey, and delegates to this special conference of the Mississippi State Labor Council. I want to say it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to be here and join with you this afternoon in this very important discussion. I'm sorry that I couldn't make it here this morning in order to hear the entire day's proceedings. I have to disagree a little bit with Claude right off. Uh, Title VII isn't a particular problem for the building trades. It's the same problem, same situation everyone else has, but it has to be handled in a particular manner in the building trades. And I'd like to very briefly this afternoon go back to uh, cover what the building trades have been doing before the law was passed. I think you have to realize that one of the first, uh, one of the first executive orders of the Kennedy administration applied uh, this problem to government contractors, both supply contractors and construction contractors. So we were covered by that executive order, and that very briefly, I won't go into detail on that, that very briefly uh, spelled out in so many words the fact that you couldn't have uh, segregation on the job or you couldn't hire your labor from an organization, whether it be a union or an employment agency, that uh, practices discrimination or segregation. And that was followed very shortly thereafter in 1961 by the Secretary of Labor's order having to do with apprenticeship training. That was called CFR 29-30. 
and that's spelled out again uh, that any apprentice program set up in the construction industry or for that matter in any other industry uh, would have to follow certain rules on procedures of admitting apprentices without uh, discrimination and so on. Now both of those orders have been in existence long before uh, the Civil Rights Act was passed and of course long before the effective date of the Civil Rights in, uh, in July of this year. So we have been working under those two orders and the first one that uh, covered the government contractors uh, resulted in a form being set up and it took a great deal of time to set this form up. This was a reporting form that had to be filled out by government construction contractors and returned to the President's Committee on Equal Employment Opportunity at regular intervals. Now that posed a problem uh, both for the unions and for the uh, contractors right off from the beginning. Uh, the committee wanted a report every week. Well, that was very, very time-consuming to uh, go around the job and uh, find out uh, what uh, each person on that particular job was. And it took a lot of time to prepare it, and it conflicted with certain state laws that prohibited any, uh, any questioning of an employee as to his race, color, or creed. It also was an insurmountable problem in, in uh, some construction work uh, to make such a head count because uh, for example, the Maelstrom Missile Base in uh, Montana, uh, that construction site was 105 miles long and 110 miles wide. And there were 160 individual construction sites within that vast uh, area. It made it almost impossible to go around to, to question people as to their race, creed, or color. But eventually that form was simplified and worked out in the uh, periods of reporting were extended to the beginning of the job, the peak of employment, and the uh, final stages of the job. Now that uh, form has been in existence for some time. Also on the, the uh, Secretary's uh, regulation, which was issued covering the apprentice programs, if a program and our, in the building construction industry, our joint, our apprenticeship training programs are joint apprenticeship programs between the employer and the union with the government and the advisory capacity as a third party. If one of those uh, programs failed to follow the uh, secretary's regulations and non-discrimination and so on, then that program would be deregistered. Well, at first uh, thought people would say, well, what difference does it make if it's deregistered? It's the employer and labor and they can go on and operate it their own way and the government was only advisory anyway. Well, it matters to this extent that no apprentice can work on federal construction unless he's in a registered program. So that required uh, compliance there. Now, I wanted to point those, uh, those two things out to point out that this Title VII and the implications in the procedure of Title VII are not new to the construction industry. This, we have been following exactly these same things and maybe in a little more detail, possibly the early executive order and the, the uh, Secretary of Labor's regulation uh, paved the way for setting up the machinery and the detail work to, to later comply with Title VII. If we didn't have those two things, we would now be looking around for ways and means and procedures of, of complying. We also have had and having in existence now nine information centers, apprenticeship information centers. Nine have been set up, and there they've been set up within the industry, uh, the local government, whether in a particular city or county, and with the Federal Department of Labor. Those uh, centers have been set up, and they're going to follow through with more and more centers to uh, make information available to the schools and more particularly to the individual member of a minority group so that he will have one focal point where he can go and find information pertaining to a particular craft in uh, the construction industry's case, a particular craft that he is interested in following or getting into. And uh, those are being set up for that purpose. Those conduct a continuing liaison with the schools in their particular community to furnish them with the information to furnish them with the uh, speakers to go out and talk to the classes 
and explain both the good and the bad uh, sides of, of entering into the construction industry, and also to uh, more or less coordinate the efforts and point out to these uh, young students the need for their staying in school and receiving a basic education. And I want to uh, I want to point out here that's that's one of the problems that we're facing, particularly in the construction industry, and more so every single day. So many of the individuals and the various minority groups are dropping out of school so early that they don't have a basic math, uh, a basic math education, and many of the other basics that are necessary to go in and follow the crafts that have become so highly technicalized today. Uh, more and more of the various trades are, are demanding, and not only a high school education, but even education beyond high school to keep up with the pace of the modern improvements in, in the uh, construction, for example, of, of power plants and the constru construction of electronic facilities, the construction of, of uh, chemical plants and, and refineries and all those things uh, where there's so much uh, technical work involved in the installation. And they, uh, the students, uh, the fellows entering those, those trades have to have a basic, a basic education. There's another point uh, I want to bring out here and that has to do with the nature of the industry and the stabilization of the construction industry. A lot of people can't understand why just somebody can't come in and do this or do that and uh, be hired right off the street without a thorough apprenticeship training or if he wants to come in as a journeyman mechanic without testing to see if he's adequately qualified. In the construction industry, there's no personnel departments as is known in other industries. A contractor can have a large construction firm and have no employees until he actually gets on a job and starts the construction. And one of the basic factors in stabilizing the industry and making that possible has been the apprentice training program and the training program for journeymen to keep upgrading them. For example, to make that more clear, uh, for example, a, a contractor in San Francisco could sit down and figure out and bid on a job, say, lathing and plastering the Pan Am building in New York City 3,000 miles away without ever seeing anything except a description of the building and the specifications and so on. And he could possibly uh, bid that job and get the, get the uh, job, and then he could get on the plane or train and go to New York by himself or maybe with a superintendent or a very small group, an engineer or something like that, arrive in New York and hire all his labor to do that job and meet his bid uh, right on the spot in New York through the unions. And he can only do that because of a standardized training program that guarantees that the production of the plaster and the lather in New York City is equal to the production of the lather or plaster in, in San Francisco. If he was to arrive in New York and go out on the street and just start hiring people to do his lathing and then his plastering, he'd be broke before the, the first week was, was up. That's a very important point in the, in the industry, and that's, that's a factor that has stabilized the industry. Another uh, problem that faces the, uh, the building industry today, and it, uh, it's, a, it's an important, a vital, and an immediate concern to all of the building industry, and it's a matter that doesn't just affect minority group members, it affects everybody. And that's the severe unemployment. Not uh, much publicity has been given to the problem of unemployment in the building industry. Nationally, since 1957, we haven't had a year under 12% unemployment. Yet the dollar volume of construction in that time has almost doubled up to 60, about 66, 67 billion dollars. Now the answer to that is new materials and automation. Our, we're putting more construction in place every year with a steadily declining workforce. And unless something's done to generate a great public works construction program, it's going to continue that way. And there's not going to be openings in the construction industry for any great numbers at all. Merely enough to keep going as it is and possibly uh, slacken down a bit if it, if it continues as it is. Now that's a very, a very important thing. And, and right now, what would be the peak of the season, as an example, New York City has about 
of the construction workers in the greater New York City area unemployed and have been unemployed for over a month. Now you can see, no matter what kind of regulations there are, what kind of procedures, how sincere you are, or anything else, there's no point in those local unions in that city going out and, and uh, shaking the uh, bushes and so on to get candidates to come in and go into an apprentice training program. They could come in and sign them up and there'd be no job for the apprentices. There aren't jobs for the journeymen. And that's another thing I want to point out here. The, in order to become an apprentice, you have to go through the procedure of the aptitude test and so on. And then after you pass everything, then the Joint Apprenticeship Committee has to find a contractor that has a job and has an opening that he can put the apprentice on. So it's not just a matter of doing it today or tomorrow. It's quite a complicated and involved thing. Then that contra a contractor may take that apprentice, put him to work, and as soon as the job is finished, the contractor's off the job and the apprentice is off the job as well as the journeyman. So the apprentice is, is out of work. Now the apprentice has to be willing and able to survive those periods between jobs, and he has to be able to survive the periods of bad weather and so on when there's no work. Now many can and many cannot. Many have to drop out and go looking for a job where they can have immediate income. And that goes back to the, to the economic necessity of, of raising the wage level of the parents and so on in order to uh, enable these kids to stay in school longer and then enable them to go into this particular industry where they have to be able to be taken care of for days here and there when they're between employment. Uh, very little uh, talk has been given to this unemployment in the building trades, very little publicity to it. If you hear of a steel mill or something becoming automated and closing down, uh, maybe a thousand people are put out of work and maybe the town becomes almost a dead town and uh, there's a lot of publicity in the papers and the magazines and so on. But uh, you've got to keep in mind in the construction industry, one new innovation can put a man out of a job on a particular building such as we're in right now. And that same innovation being employed around the country on 20 or 25,000 jobs means there are 20 or 25,000 people put out of work just like that. There's not the impact of publicity because they're so scattered that you don't notice it. But in the overall, it, it has a terrific impact. And we've been, in addition to uh, the new materials now, we've been uh, automated more than any industry in the country. Uh, the size of the equipment has about doubled. The size of trucks, the size of earth moving equipment. Uh, the use of the tower crane on the buildings. And uh, the use of precast paneling to face the buildings with, taking the place of brick and so on. All of those things added up have caused this, this unemployment. Now if we had a vast public works program if we had more enlightened people in Congress that would vote for a real huge, vast public works program to take care of the need for housing, to take care of the need for all the roads and the hospitals and so on, then we could put all the people to work and start bringing in numbers and numbers more. And then that in turn would generate terrific, what we call off-site employment. There's more off-site employment in constructing a building than there is on the site. For every job on the site, there's almost two jobs off the site. You can see that when we talk about uh, housing, for example, uh, building 10,000 homes, these low cost, low rental homes, these multiple units, building 10,000 of those would require alone 47 million brick. Now you can see how many uh, brick and clay workers that would put to work. Uh, the Verzano Narrows Bridge that goes from Staten Island to New York City, which was recently opened, the longest bridge in this country. It took the United States Steel Company three and a half years to make the wire that went into the cables, the suspension cables on that bridge. It only took five and a half months to spin the cable on, at the site. It took enough concrete in that bridge to build a four-lane highway 243 miles long just to put in the footings and the roadway. It took the full 
structural steel capacity of the U.S. Steel Company to, to manufacture the steel that went into the roadbed of that bridge. So you can see how much off-site employment just that one single bridge accomplished. Now when we think about uh, the predictions that in the next 15 years, 30 million people will be added to the population of this country. 30 million people. And we're not even taking care of the needs today. You can drive through this city, you can drive through any city in the country, and you can just knock out whole areas. You can tear down whole areas of housing and replace them. And you still would hardly be keeping up with the current need to say nothing of what's going to happen within the next 15 years. I'm not talking about 100 years or the year 2000 or anything. I'm talking about the next 15 years. And we don't have the hospital facilities. We pass, uh, probably will pass this Medicare law on people, the aged people go to the hospital. What good would the law do if there isn't a hospital for them to go to? We don't have the adequate uh, hospitals uh, now around the country. The same thing we talk about uh, doctor services and that and clinics and so on. We don't have those built to take care of the present needs, let alone the future. I want to mention those things because this is all interrelated with the problem that we're meeting here on today. And we can talk all we want to about solving this phase of the problem or that phase of the problem. The whole thing has to come in a package. We have to start education. We have to build the schools to educate these children. We have to keep them in the schools until they're educated and come out and co go into these various crafts and various industries and so on with the proper background to receive the training and go ahead and do a job. And they won't be able to go ahead and do the job unless we have a program of public construction, federal construction, state construction, and local construction that will generate the on-site employment in the construction industry and the off-site employment in the construction industry for those young people who want to go into the related and supplying industries, whether it be in steel or mining or lumber or uh, what have you. And that's the problem we have to consider, I believe, when we consider any of this thing. It's been said time after time, what good is it to uh, give a man an okay to do this if he hasn't got the money uh, to go in and buy a cup of coffee? What good is it okay to uh, give a man uh, the right and the opportunity and everything else to go into a particular uh, craft apprenticeship program if there's no job for him when he becomes an apprentice? So we have to tie that all together. Now, I brought with me a very brief uh, little pamphlet on Title VII as interpreted by the uh, attorneys for the Building Construction Trades Department. And I, it's written in, uh, it's not written in attorney's language, it's written in language that we all can read and understand uh, quickly. And I think I have enough here for everyone in the room, if you want to uh, pass them out afterwards. I think it's very interesting, it points out what uh, has to be done and what you don't have to do. And I think you'll all find it very interesting. So with those few remarks, if it's permissible, I'd like to stop now and throw the, we open the questions. Thank you, Bill, for those uh, pertinent remarks. Certainly the matter could all be solved with full employment, right? Be no problems. Well, we have a full panel this afternoon. So who wants the first shot, the first question? We got three gentlemen here now to answer the questions. Uh, who wants it first? We don't have any. No questions? Yeah, Brother Taylor. Well, in order to kind of kick this thing off, somebody has to break the ice. Brother Max Sorley has <clears throat> pretty well covered this thing, I imagine, and some of these questions I have in mind here, he uh, has uh, practically answered the questions. But it occurs to me that to bring it a little bit closer down to us, that we might ask a question or two, and I would ask this. 
Uh, this is Taylor with the carpenters and the building trades. Uh, is it required to accept applications for membership when there are no job opportunities? I believe he answered that in a way, but not specifically uh, in response to that question as so asked. Is it required to accept applications, that is, for a local union, for membership, when there are no job opportunities? Are, are you talking about an uh, application as a journeyman? Yes, there are, an apprentice either, either one. To, uh, well, no, it, it differs. Uh, as far as an apprentice is concerned, you have to accept an apprentice's application or an apprentice, an application from a potential apprentice. Yes. You accept his application and consider his application and handle his application in exactly the same manner as you would anyone else. Yes. The same test, uh, the same points if you have a point system and so on. Then based on his mark um, on the overall testing procedure he would go on the list exactly the same as anyone else if he fell number one he would be number one on that class if he fell number five he'd be five or ten or a hundred or if he flunked he would flunk now you have to maintain and i'm talking now uh, thinking of title seven and the secretary's order and the executive order because they're all intertwined they're all effective are still in effect, I should say. Uh, you have to keep those records then on hand for uh, two years, subject to review. And there's a procedure if the apprentice, apprentice uh, feels that he's been uh, uh, given the wrong grade or not given a fair test, uh, he has an appeals procedure. Most of the organizations are not handling the testing anymore themselves. They're, they're turning the test over to the Bureau of Employment Security or some independent uh, testing group. Uh, for example, in Washington, D.C., the iron workers hired the Bell Associates to devise a test, and they studied the uh, iron working craft, devised a test, and, and they used a lot of the old test as a basis, and then they in turn administered the test to all of the applicants that came down from the different groups to uh, try to to try to uh, get an apprenticeship as an iron worker uh, that that does that cover the apprentice yes sir. Right. now on a journeyman in most cases uh, a journeyman wouldn't come down to the local as I see unless he was offered a job by an employer do you agree with me in some cases that yes. would be true then in others it would not yeah. then let us take that first. If the employer offers the uh, journeyman a, a job, he tells him to go down to the union and uh, get referred out, the union would have to act on that. Yeah. Now, if he came down just from, just walked in and wanted to join the union, then you would have the right to give him a journeyman's test and to test him as you would test anyone else that applied to be a journeyman. Yeah. Say you went out and, and uh, uh, organized the uh, ABC Millwright Company or something and, and uh, he had five employees and you made an agreement, you'd test them. If they were okay, you'd take them in. Uh, you'd have to give him the same test as anyone else in journeyman status. Now, this other question. Now, you could, you, know, you could, it's very unlikely, but it could happen. Uh, you could bring him in and there'd be no job for him because he would have to go on the list, the referral list, and he might not get out for quite yeah. a while. Uh, that pretty well answers another question I had here, but not exactly. Would it be incumbent on the local unions to actively seek participation our membership in the local union. You mean does the local union have to go out and find people and bring them in? Yes. No. Now how about this? Most cases, most cases they're out. 
They're out looking for members' homes. Now, how, how would this uh, procedure that you mentioned in regard to the journeyman, how would that apply in a right-to-work state? <coughs> Which this well, happens to be one. You're talking about bringing him into the union? Now, now you, we You're mentioned bringing the journeyman into your, 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 the journeyman wants to join your union? Uh, well, we'll take it uh, that he goes to the contractor first, and the contractor has a job for him. Now, where, where would the local union be if, and where does it fit in in a situation like that? I suppose that under the, the right to work, so-called right to work law, the <coughs> management could go ahead and hire the man, whether or not he ever saw the union office or not. Right. I would think if the contractor, whether it was a uh, right to work state or not, if the contractor s had a job for him and sent him down to the local to apply, to become a member and be referred back out, you'd have to follow the same procedure, whether it was right to work or not. Uh, so let's take a hypothetical situation here. Suppose that, uh, that a local union would say, in effect, that our books are closed and that we have all of the workforce that we anticipate that we may need presently and in the foreseeable future. Now, how would a situation like that work in connection with Title VII? As far as I understand it, it would be all right. If you're closed, if there are no opportunities, there's no, going to be no class, no apprentice class starting, you don't have to start one, just take care of somebody. In other words, if uh, your force is adequate, you know, I mean, even have unemployment in, within the local union, uh, you're certainly not going to go out and start an apprentice training program, and you're not required to go out and start one just just to uh, to start one. Well, that pretty well answers the questions I had in mind, and uh, maybe some of these other people would like to ask some questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Mack. I saw another one in the back there. Well, didn't I see B.R. Upton? Might as well stay up here. This is B.R. Upton with the Carpenters. Uh, on the question of the journeyman coming to join the union, and we're talking about in the right to work state, unions would not have to accept them accept his membership and accept them into the union unless he met the qualifications as of a journeyman. Oh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's what I mean, just because of the fact that Bob Boss told him, I'll give you a Hold job. On. No, I, if, I thought I pointed that out when I said if he met the qualifications and took the test. Uh, in this bulletin I picked up out there on the, on the table, and we're talking about the job discrimination, and the 100 on the July, and I'm right on down to 25 or more in four, three years, four years. Then there's a period there, and it says a union operating a job referral system is covered if it refers person to an employer covered by the act. Now, just what, we're, what are we talking about in this thing in job referral system? Now, there's some building trades unions that have exclusive hiring hall systems. Others refer people, but they don't have the exclusive hiring hall system. When are we talking about that the, that the act covers those people? We'll take the plumber. Now, he, the plumber, the fitter, he has an exclusive hiring hall system. Well, if he had uh, any number of men, he'd be covered by the act from the beginning. Is that what we're talking about? Here's what it, here's what it says. However, unions with hiring halls or referral systems regardless of the number of members, become subject to these provisions of the law one year after enactment. And one year after enactment is the 2nd of July, 
I believe it's the second of July of this year. Yeah. Now I'll read this quote, this well, whole thing, if you want me to. That's probably in that bulletin it's you in have this there. Pamphlet, yeah. I think that clears what I wanted there. Have any other questions? I have a question. I'm not too sure who wants to answer this one. There hasn't been anything much said so far as to what the penalties are if the law has not been complied with. I'd like uh, to find out, uh, probably Brother Carroll might want to answer this particular question. Mine. Uh, I think I answered it in part this morning, Claude, in another connection. The law is, in this sense, a negative thing that the practices which go on with regard to hiring, firing, promotions, and all this kind of thing continue in effect until a complaint is made by an individual uh, saying that I've been discriminated against because of my race, color, creed, sex, or national origin. And the penalties under the law become effective if there is no conciliation as carried on by the commission and the problem is not resolved, then that individual complainant can go to court and say to the, to the circuit court, I've been discriminated against uh, by the employer or the union or the, the apprenticeship program or the, the uh, uh, employment agency. The court then is empowered by the act to assess whatever is the appropriate remedy by that particular set of facts. That might be simply an injunction to cease doing what you're doing or, to, or an affirmative direction to, to employ that person or to reinstate that person or to promote that person or whatever the case may be, including back pay or, or any other remedy that might seem to be suitable under the circumstances. <laughs> this, of course, is the, the um, thing which we are cautioning our, our locals to be exceedingly careful about because when you become a defendant in that kind of a open-end proposition, you could get practically any kind of of penalty imposed upon you that the judge, the particular judge, thought was suitable. And uh, if he happened to be a, a, uh, an anti-labor judge uh, and uh, he might devise a pretty stiff kind of penalty for you. So that uh, that's where the penalties come into effect at the time when it becomes a formal court proceeding. I'll let the expert from the labor, the labor board answer that. What, what, uh, well, I, I would just expect your certification for the board. Under certain circumstances, uh, there is no question but what the board will revoke a certification if the union and the company are administering a contract in a discriminatory manner based on race or color. If a motion is filed with the board for the revocation of such a certification, the board has said <coughs> it would do so. I think that answers your question. Brother Jones. I'm with the carpenters, Logan. I want to refer back to the apprenticeship program. You said you would have them give an altitude test and classify them one, two, and three, A, B, and C. And an employee calls in there and he calls for 
said to B employee, uh, B grade, could he go out before the A B, uh, grade could? Could he what now? You classify them as A, B, yeah, and C, right. or one, two, and three, whichever way you want to. And he called for the one that's on the B grade, specifies that Bill Jones is the uh, number B grade. Could he go out ahead of A? Not it's if it's been customary that A would go first. Regardless of whether he wanted them or not. All right, and referring back to the apprenticeship school that takes a four-year program, I mean a four-year school, and we get the amount of apprentices that we can continue to support the employee, and next year we don't take any in, they can continue having the school with the one that's already signed up and qualified without having to take in any the one year. We can skip a year and take yes, in. Yes, absolutely. Okay. I said you. before, you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to change uh, the pattern to the point where, for example, if you start a class in, in uh, let us say you, you have testing in April and start a class the 15th of April, and that's been the custom, and you pick out 10 or 12 or 15, uh, whatever the current demand happens to be and the demand over that four-year span and, of course, the demand for the long-run future, then you only have to have that test again next April if you're going to bring others in. Now, if something happens, there's not going to be a new class. You don't have to have I mean, there's no need for a new class. You don't have to have it. You follow me? Yes. Any more questions? Over here. Eddie Miller with the laborers. Uh, to Mr. Liebes. Uh, a moment ago, you explained that the board could do something in so far as the certification is concerned. But in the building trades, many of the contracts are arrived at without any previous certification for many, many years. Now, is there any remedy before the board in a case where you're not a certified representative, but you've been bargaining for a number of years with the contractor? And if there is some discrimination, or if there is these issues that come up, does anyone have a, does any individual have a remedy before the board in those cases? Yes, there would be a remedy, and the remedy would be more severe than the replication of a certification. I'm sorry I asked the question. Pardon me? I said, I'm sorry I asked the question, but go ahead. Uh, you see, the situation arises only when someone files a charge or a motion or a petition with us. We take no action in any situation on our own motion. So in a sense, it's the nature of the proceeding that's filed will sometimes determine the result. More frequently than not, there would be charges filed instead of petitions or motions to revoke a certification anyway. There would be limited circumstances under which there would be an appropriate filing of a motion to revoke a certification because the remedy is no, no, no more than that. Uh, there's no remedy to that except to just no longer certify. Mm -hmm. So in time, eventually, it would be discovered by those who seek the assistance of the labor board that the only effective remedy from the standpoint of a situation where there was actual discrimination would be a charge. So we may as well address ourselves to that question, and this would apply whether it was a building trades or any other union that had not been certified but which functions as the exclusive bargaining agency to represent these people. The board and the act and the court say this union acquires a responsibility at the point at which it becomes the exclusive bargaining representative to represent all the people fairly and without discrimination. 
this is true because it has the exclusive bargaining status. Now, if they were for members only, they wouldn't have this responsibility, you see. It's only acquired, but it is definitely acquired when they are the exclusive bargaining representative. So the remedy would be, under these circumstances, if it, in fact it was proven to be the case, a merit to the charge, to reinstate with back pay an employee who may have been deprived of an economic benefit, such as his job or promotion or a transfer or something of this nature. And such as they did in the rubber workers' case, if you're under a government contract situation, you've already signed pledges to comply, they might say you try to negotiate with your employer a provision in the contract which says you will not in the future do this. Mm -hmm. It also goes for hiring. Now, when you're getting to hiring and you're talking about a referral system <laughs> or a hiring hall, you're getting into a special area which uh, wouldn't generally apply to a lot of problems that you have or the questions might not be the same. Uh, in a right to work state uh, where there is a strict adherence to the so-called right to work laws, you have a different situation than you have in a state where there is no such so-called right to work law. So these things have to be qualified. If a man is deprived of a job discriminatorily by the exclusive bargaining agency who has the exclusive right to refer to the job, the remedy would go to the exclusive bargaining agency or the union mm -hmm. if, in fact, it was a refusal to hire and discrimination under this act, and they would pay the back pay. However, the employer is liable here because he has delegated to the union this responsibility to select the people. So a charge, if filed, should be filed against both the company and the union so that they both pay the back pay and see that this man goes to work. If the charge is only filed against the union, the remedy we can give is limited in that we can only say to the union, you advise the employer you have no objections to them hiring this man. If the charge is filed against both the union and the company, the remedy is more than this because there would be the additional request or order that the employer offer him that job. And then the union would have to say to the union company and the employee, it has no objections to his being hired. Well, I, I could understand Mr. Liebes insofar as being a member or not being a member of the union. But will the same thing apply insofar as discrimination because of race, creed, well, or color? I'm talking now, uh, if in fact the exclusive bargaining representative entered into a contract which set up this procedure, I think that, as the board has already said, that the union may be in violation of our act. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, what we're going to look for is a clarification since this Civil Rights Section 7 will go into effect, yet if it's pure and simple, and I say this advisedly because nothing's pure and nothing's simple, uh, if it is apparent that it comes under the Civil Rights Commission, we will say go to them. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the General Counsel's policy and further answer to your question. And I think if the parties should be advised that if it is a question that comes within the definition of a discrimination under these five points under the Civil Rights Act, that the parties should look to the Civil Rights Commission for a remedy. Rather than the board. Definitely. Right. Definitely. In the legislative history of the discussion of this act, you will find that answer. Mm -hmm. And that was that the labor board should administer this particular section of Title VII. Now, Congress specifically said no. 
This has been passed upon by Congress. It's been discussed in Congress. And the act that has been passed is the result of deciding the answer to this question is that the Labor Board will not administer Title VII of the act. Good. That answers my question. Now let me ask you a question to Mr. McSorley. Brother McSorley, pardon me. Uh, we know in this instance that it, in Title VII that the employer, and I'm particularly called, uh, talking about building contractors now, have a, uh, quite a responsibility on their hands. Now, what are they going to do in those areas where they come in? Let's take this San Francisco contractor that you're talking about that comes to Jackson, Mississippi to build a job. And he's never had one employee working for him before in Jackson, Mississippi. And he's going to hire up for a job. And uh, there are available craftsmen, both white and Negro. Some of them belong to the union, some of them don't. Or laborers, not only craftsmen, but laborers. Now, under his obligation under the law, and let's say that he has enough employees, he will have enough employees to be covered by the law from the very beginning. Uh, what is his obligation to seek those people to work for him, to be employed by him, and fulfill the obligations under that law? Well, <coughs> if it was federal construction, he has to sign a statement as to the source of his uh, laborers and mechanics mm -hmm. and stipulate that they in turn have assured him by a statement that they do not discriminate in any way, shape, or form because of race, creed, or color. Mm -hmm. But it, then we go a little bit farther than that. Then in actual practice, why there is discrimination. And what happens? Well, if, uh, if there is discrimination, it can be proven, then he can be, uh, his contract can be abrogated. Mm -hmm. Well, let's For forget example, about they, they uh, had a problem in Chicago, and they threatened to abrogate the contract of the federal building being constructed in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, they got the problem straightened out, but the the uh, threat is always there, and it can be enforced. Mm -hmm. But under the under the law, that goes in effect on July the second, and this applies applies to private construction too, other than and other uh, yeah. other than yeah. federal construction. Now, in those instances, they are not required to, to put the statement into the contract between them and the union, or get a statement from the contractor or the union that they are uh, not discriminating. It's a law now. They're not supposed to discriminate. No, but here, here again, uh, the contractor that would come in here to build would proceed to recruit his labor in the same manner he always has. Mm -hmm. And this is on private construction, we'll say. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem, as I see it, doesn't arise until for some reason or other someone's discriminated against. Mm -hmm. Or it's proven that a local union is practicing some form of discrimination in its referral system. Mm -hmm. In other words, if that contractor comes in here, is on uh, private construction, he calls a local union for, uh, say, 10 carpenters, uh, calls another one for uh, laborers and another for some plumbers, as he would do any other city that he goes to being a union contractor. He doesn't have to fill out or approve anything. Mm -hmm. But if somebody finds out that uh, the union was practicing a discrimination, then he becomes a party to that. Mm -hmm. That's spelled out in the in the uh, in the Civil Rights Digest. There's a little. I can read it if you if you'd. Uh, I'd like you to do that. Here, uh, unlawful employment practices. Now this this applies to anything. One discriminatory uh, by a labor union, discriminatory exclusion or expulsion from membership. Two discriminatory segregation or classification of membership or referral practices which tend to deprive any individual of employment opportunities or otherwise adversely affect employee status. Three, causing or attempting to cause an employer to discriminate. In other words, if he was hiring his uh, plumbers from your hall and you were, you were uh, practicing discrimination, as I interpret, 
he then in turn would become a party to your violation of the law and you're, you're actually causing him to discriminate. Now by an employer, one, discriminatory failure or refusal to hire or discharge or other discrimination with respect to compensation terms, conditions, or privileges of employment. Two, discrimination, discriminatory segregation or classification of employees which tend to deprive any individual of employment opportunities or otherwise adversely affect employee status. Joint apprenticeship committees or employers or unions are likewise prohibited from discrimination in admission to or employment in any program established to provide apprenticeship <coughs> or other training. That goes on to explain employment agencies are prohibited from discriminatory failure or refusal to refer for employment. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much. Again, this is probably a two-part question. I think I maybe might know what we should do, but I'd like to get a clarification from Mr. Levis, I think. And, uh, we have occasionally, all of us see in the paper where people advertise for white employees or for union or non-union employees. Now, recently in the Jackson paper here, some contractor had advertised for non-union carpet. Then again, you see where he advertises for a white plumber or electrician or a carpenter or something like that. Is those, is those uh, that's a violation of the law, I believe, and what would be the appropriate steps and who should take those steps if they wanted to do something about that? You want to answer that, you got <laughs> I'll attempt to answer one-fourth of that question. <laughs> I, I got to answer the other, maybe. And then you get the other three-fourths of the answer from him. Which part are you going to answer now? <laughs> I'm not going to say until I decide just how much of it I can answer. No, seriously, uh, we would have no jurisdiction over an advertisement uh, of hiring white or colored people. That would not come under our jurisdiction. The point at which our agency's jurisdiction would be invoked would be the point at which there is discrimination against a person because he is a member of the union or he's been discharged because of his efforts to join a union or at the point of hire if they refuse to hire him because he's not a member of the union, for example, if you've got an exclusive hiring arrangement. Then you bring into play the proposition of whether it was done because he was a member of the union or not a member of the union. And only at the point where his job situation would be affected. <coughs> now this matter of advertising for union or non-union people, I've never had it before, never had the issue to, to, to even consider. Uh, I'd have to answer that in this way. I'd have to know the, what the ad itself said. I'd have to know under what circumstances. I think, again, here, you'd be a situation in a right-to-work state would be different, perhaps, than others. I'm not sure of the answer to that question. I don't know. That's why I say I can only answer part of it. Bill, you want to? What's the other part, he said? Well, uh, about where he hires for Advertise well, for white help, you know, or, white or, 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 or colored yeah. help, you know. Yeah. Yeah. There again, and I'm not an expert on this, as, as you well realize, I don't think there'd be any problem uh, advertising for a white person unless a minority person went down and uh, answered the ad. Then I think you'd have to show why you couldn't hire him. I think I think that's the way it's going to work. I think someone will have to file a complaint. There's a uh, I might point out here in connection with this advertising. There's a uh, been a campaign on since 1961 for uh, what they call equal employment oppor equal opportunity employers. 
and wherein they try to get these corporations and companies to go out and seek minority workers and various skills that they need or for their training programs and that. And it applies almost solely to manufacturing. And in all the time, since 1961, only 297 companies have joined that. And there's 300,000 manufacturing companies alone in this country. So you can see how little the employers that actually have control of the jobs have done to uh, go along with this plan and try to open up opportunity to the members of the minorities. 297 out of at least 300,000 manufacturing companies have joined that Plans for Progress. As we sit here and discuss all these problems, that there's very few people in this room uh, that actually can offer anyone a job or give them a job. The jobs are in these companies, and those companies have failed to to see this and to take uh, part in this overall program. Do we have any other questions? going to get into another phase of the program shortly as the gentleman gets back up. I'm sure that all of you are familiar with the fact that the State Chamber of Commerce, the MEC, several months ago took a very courageous step advise the people in Mississippi that we must have law and order. There's been much said about the Chamber's position on behalf of law and order that the laws of this nation should be abided by. Unfortunately, <coughs> the state of Mississippi was almost wrecked before these people began to see the light. I don't think it's necessary for this organization to take a position in favor of law and order because, hell, we believe in law and order from the start, at the outset. Laws of this nation have to be abided by whether we like them or not. We call this conference today in hopes that the officers of our local unions would be better equipped to deal with the problems that would arise as a result of the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. We realize, of course, that we have a few officers, some of our local unions, that don't like the law. Possibly some of our the officers of some of our local unions will see fit to try to violate this law. Now, that's all right with me, if that's the way they want to run their business. But we wanted the officers of the locals in this state to know what was required of them on the terms of this act. And after they went back home, if they want to wind up being held in contempt of court, eventually having some treasures busted, and even go to jail, and that was perfectly all right with us. We felt as officers of this organization that we should arrange a conference of this kind on an educational basis. Now, <clears throat> you've heard mention of right to work, some of the problems created as a result of the right to work law in Mississippi. Fortunately, at the present time, the Congress is considering a piece of legislation will take care of this matter. And our next speaker will deal with that particular subject. At least part of his remarks will be aimed in that direction. Most of you are acquainted with uh, our next speaker, Brother Stanton Smith, the coordinator of state and local central bodies. He's a former president of the T Tennessee Labor Council. He's been with us at uh, the last several conventions. As a matter of fact, he addressed our last convention. At this time, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to Brother, Brother Smith to you who will discuss a matter of pending legislation before Congress. Brother Smith. 
Thank you very much, Claude. Representatives of the labor movement of Mississippi and my distinguished colleagues here on the platform. It's true that I have uh, attended a number of your conventions over the years. As a matter of fact, I think the first one that I attended was back in 1949, which is a year or two ago, I think. And I have watched the labor movement in Mississippi develop through these years with a great deal of interest because of the proximity with my own state of Tennessee. And we shared many of the same problems that have uh, beset the labor movement of this state. Sweatshop wages, the runaway employer, the appeals to prejudice and all of the other things which have hindered the development of the labor movement <coughs> in the South. It's unfortunate for you that uh, I'm speaking again because I only have one speech, which means you're going to have to hear it all over again, the one I made at your last convention. But at the outset, I want to uh, express to you my very sincere admiration for the wonderful progress that the labor movement in this state is making, the courageous leadership which has been provided for you by the officers and members of the executive board of your state labor council, the officers of our local central bodies, the representatives of the international union, and the leadership generally of the labor movement in this state. You have made real progress. There's a lot of progress yet to be made. But if anyone had told me two years ago that we could have this kind of a meeting here in Jackson, Mississippi, to discuss in the calm and reasoned manner that you have today some of the problems that we've been talking about, I would have not thought it possible. But here we are discussing some of the most basic and fundamental problems that beset us as human beings and as members of the labor movement. So I think that uh, we have every reason and right to look forward to a brighter day. And as I said at your last convention, I think the day is going to come when the labor movement in Mississippi and the other states of the South is going to point the way toward the solution to some of these vexing problems for the labor movement in the rest of the country. Uh, the testing in fire that you have gone through and are going through is the kind of thing that tempers the metal and makes it hold an edge. So I look forward with optimism to the months and years ahead, not with pessimism. But in saying this, I do not intend to play down the problems that are still ahead, because they are many and they are tough problems, and they are not going to be easily solved, and I do not kid myself in that regard. But the job that I've been asked to do here today is to deal with the legislative situation as we find it in, in Washington and to point out some of the activities which you as responsible leaders of the labor movement here in Mississippi uh, can engage in in the furtherance of the legislative objectives and the legislative goals of the AFL-CIO. In a very real sense, the AFL-CIO has come to be uh, known as the people's lobby. You know, in Washington, we have all kinds of lobbyists, thousands of them. And almost without exception, they represent certain special interests with certain special 
privileges they are either trying to gain or protect. But no one can look at the legislative program of the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations and say that labor has a narrow, selfish outlook in terms of the objectives which it is trying to seek. Back in January, we published a little pamphlet entitled AFL-CIO Legislative Goals for 1965. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen this pamphlet. Probably many of you have not. It's worth taking a look at. Some of the objectives set forth in here already are becoming a reality. Others are on the verge of becoming a reality. Now this is labor's program. And it's a very interesting thing to compare labor's program of legislation with the program of the administration. Because for the first time in 30 years or more, we find a very close parallel between the objectives of the administration and the objectives of the labor movement. Let me indicate the, the nature and scope of labor's concern for America. This pamphlet says, let us first uh, summarize our goals. And then it says this, we believe in the total elimination of poverty in America. We believe that this requires, first of all, jobs at good wages for all who are able and willing to work. And second, a social insurance program that protects young and old alike from the economic hazards which are no fault of their own. We believe in full and equal opportunity, full and equal rights for every American in every phase of life, regardless of race, creed, color, or national origin. We believe this equality can be brought about only if there is full employment. We believe that free collective bargaining is an indispensable element in the search for economic justice and personal liberty for workers. We believe in the wise use of America's riches to create a richer life for all Americans. We believe that government, the instrument of the people, should use its powers to attack and to solve the people's problems. We believe that progress toward these goals can be made in the 1965 session of Congress by the measures set forth below. And then it enumerates some of the specific objectives that we have in terms of legislation for the 1965 session of Congress. And I submit to you that this program described in these terms is truly a program for the American people, not just for the members of the labor movement. But labor has been working under a rather severe handicap for the last number of years, ever since the passage of the Taft-Hartley Law, which included that rather curious provision known as 14B, which by which the federal government abrogated its responsibility and its legal rights and said to the states that you can enact legislation which will supersede the, the national law with respect to one particular thing. And so we have, for the first time, put first on our program the repeal of 14B as our number one legislative ob objective. And even in seeking repeal of 14B, it is our contention that we are going, we are going beyond mere benefit for the labor movement, that we are in fact seeking to benefit 
the entire country because the repeal of this iniquitous provision will help us to, bi to build a stronger and a more responsible labor movement, one which can devote its time and its energies to the achievement of the real purposes of the labor movement and not have to spend its time defending itself from the backdoor attacks of our traditional enemies. To list the proponents of so-called right-to-work legislation, which is made legal and possible only by the existence of Section 14B, is to give the lie to the claim that these so-called right-to-work laws has, have as their objective the protection of the freedom of the individual worker. Who is it that advocates right-to-work legislation and now defends 14B so that they can continue to seek the establishment of such laws in other states, in addition to the 19 which now have them? The National Association of Manufacturers, long a defender of individual liberty of the working man. The United States Chamber of Commerce, certainly the most aggressive champion of the right of workers through the years. The Farm Bureau Federation, that association of farmers who run banks. These are the advocates of right-to-work legislation, seeking to defend the right of individual workers. And how do they operate? They operate through the so-called National Right-to-Work Committee. And they're now busy putting their testimony into the record in the congressional hearings in Washington trying to prove how much they are concerned with the rights of the individual American working man. And who are some of the people that support the National Right to Work Committee? Well, let me refer to one such person, a man by the name of Roger Milligan. Milligan has a K in it. He sent out a letter soliciting funds for the National Right to Work Committee so that they could carry on their iniquitous campaign for the establishment of so-called right to work laws. And at the head of this letter which he sent out there was a slogan which is the slogan of the committee which reads Americans must have the right but not be compelled to join unions. Now who is Mr. Roger Milliken? Well, the employees of one of Mr. Milliken's textile mills, just one of them, he has a whole string of them. This one happened to be at Darlington, South Carolina. They voted for union representation. In a, an election conducted by the National Labor Relations Board. And what did Mr. Milliken do? Well, he promptly shut down the mill. And then when in desperation at losing their jobs, 83% of his employees signed a petition pledging to renounce the union if only he would keep the mill in operation. What did Milliken do? He coldly replied that this indicated there were still 17% hardcore union supporters in Darlington. The workers were thrown on the streets shortly before Christmas, and the textile equipment was sold at auction. So much for the right to work, as espoused by Mr. Milliken. And then there was another one, a man by the name of F. Gano Chance, a Missouri businessman who came to Oklahoma where we recently went through a right to work referendum. 
and where it was voted down by a relatively narrow margin and largely as the result of the 99% support of the Negro community in Oklahoma were we able to defeat that so-called right to work. Well, he ca this Mr. Gano Chance came up with the most unique argument for banning the union shop, which is the thing at issue in these so-called right to work laws. According to the Oklahoma Times, his thesis was that a right to work law is good because it will make unions stronger and more active. Now, Mr. Chance does not, of course, want to ban strikes, which is our ultimate weapon. His view, the newspaper reported, is that workers should have the right to strike as individuals, but not as an organization. And it might be noted that both Milliken and Chance, as well as a host of other leaders of the right to work movement, including a top executive of the National Right to Work Committee, are open and admitted members and leaders of the John Birch Society. So much for the argument that they want to protect the right of the individual worker. In the last eight years, the AFL-CIO has been engaged in more than 40 significant right-to-work fights. 29 of these involve contests in the state legislature where it was proposed to enact right-to-work legislation so-called by the legislature. Seven of these were statewide referendums. The balance of the 40 were attempts to obtain enough signatures to force a referendum on the subject of enacting such a law. And millions of dollars and thousands of man hours have been wasted in this fruitless struggle. The result of all this, of these 40 fights, was that two states adopted such a law and one of them repealed it. This is really a staggering waste of manpower and money to no real purpose. What is the real base of the argument about repeal of 14B? The ones who advocate keeping it, as I have indicated, say they want to protect the right of the individual working man. The newspapers now are filled with editorials which make this point. You find the letters to the editors being written by people which make this point. And there was a very interesting one in the paper yesterday here in Jackson. It was the, f I wish I had torn it out. I really, I uh, really should have uh, kept it. The most unusual set of uh, economic statistics that I have ever listened to. Uh, obviously, the person who wrote the letter didn't uh, know what these figures meant, uh, or certainly he would never have uh, stated them in the form that he did. He was giving percentages on income and increase in uh, uh, industry and uh, value added by manufacture, you know, this, these kind of economic terms uh, that even uh, we don't know what they mean. But uh, these percentage figures were not related to anything. It's like that ad that says our bread stays fresh three days longer. Three days longer than what? Anyway, what is the real thing at issue on the question of repealing 14b? Well, as a general matter, when Congress passes a law, a national law, under the authority of the Constitution of the United States, that law takes precedence over state legislation on the same subject. 
except in one instance, 14b of the Taft-Hartley Law. There, because some seven states had already enacted so-called right-to-work legislation at the time Taft-Hartley was passed, and there was the big drive going on post-World War II against the unions, Congress wrote a neat little provision into the law which says that uh, unions cannot have a closed shop, but they may have a limited form of union shop. They didn't even permit a complete and full union shop. You can have a limited form of union shop, except in those states which want to say that you can't. Now, that's exactly what the law says. Now, it says it in legal terms, but I'm telling you what it says in plain English. And this is the kind of a proposition that we're dealing with. Then they go and build this tremendous tower of argument on this kind of a base. Now, I submit to you that if the question of compulsory unionism is an issue that should be dealt with by law, then it should be dealt with by federal law, not by state law because we need in this country one national labor policy, not 50 different labor policies. This is one country, not 50 countries. And in, this is even more true today than when the Constitution was written, because with the jet airplanes and uh, radio and television and one dollar long distance telephone calls from one coast to the other if you'll just wait to nine o'clock and dial direct. We move around this country now from Washington to Jackson, Mississippi in less than half a day as Bill McStorley just demonstrated for us where it used to take you that long to get to the county courthouse. And in the kind of a complex industrial society that we have developed in this country, we can't afford to have 50 different labor policies. Because what happens in Mississippi or in Tennessee affects what happens in Massachusetts and in Pennsylvania and vice versa. So our position on 14B is quite simple. We should have one national policy. That should be the national law. 14B should be repealed so that we will not have this kind of a backdoor overriding of national law by the states. <laughs> Why is it these people want this, these laws? The truth of the matter is that they're not a bit interested in the individual. They're interested in inducing industry to come to Mississippi or Tennessee or Alabama or some other right-to-work state. What kind of industry do they get? You know, low-wage sweatshop industry. What kind of an economy does this make? Well, it makes profits for some people, but it doesn't make for very good living for the workers. Low wage standards. Then what do they do? They start monkeying with the unemployment compensation law. Make it harder to draw unemployment compensation. Increase the reasons why a worker should be disqualified. Why? So as to lower the tax on the employer so that they can say, come to our state and you won't have to pay as much unemployment insurance tax. Anything to induce the marginal employer to come in and exploit uh, the labor of that state. This was very clearly pointed out 
or rather it was uh, revealed unexpectedly or unintentionally by Mississippi businessmen from uh, Tallahatchie. He wrote to this man up in Connecticut, you know, and said, just come down here where we have 98% native-born labor, most of them high school graduates. They'll work for anywhere from 6 to 49 cents below the rest of the southern states and anywhere from 50 to 95 cents below the northern states. And, you know, it's truly American labor, and he didn't say it in these words, but you won't be bothered with any unions if you just come down here because we got us a right-to-work law. Now, this is entirely aside from the argument over the whole principle and problem that's involved in the question of union security. But the only thing at issue on 14b is that the questions of union security should be dealt with by national law and not by 50 different state laws. That's the crucial issue. And we'll debate the merits of union membership so-called compulsory union membership of the union shop. We'll debate the merits of that in the forum where it should be debated and not let it be used for this kind of undermining of labor standards and exploitation of people. Well, now what is the situation? President Johnson sent his labor message to Congress a couple of weeks ago. He proposed that the Fair Labor Standards Act, the so-called wage and hour law, should be amended. He wasn't as specific in some of the amendments as uh, we are. We think the minimum should be raised to $2 an hour. We think the standard work week should be lowered to 35 hours a week in keeping with the increased productivity of American workers and to help take up some of the um, slack in the unemployment. We think that we're going to, we need double time provisions for overtime instead of time and a half to induce some of the employers to create more jobs for the four million people who are uh, totally unemployed and the other three million who are only partially employed. President Johnson also called for improvements in the unemployment compensation system and the establishment of federal standards and a number of other things, and he called for repeal of 14B. As a result of that, we're now in the midst of a hearing. Probably about the middle of July, we'll get a vote on this in the House. The real battle is in the House of Representatives. Now, there's no use kidding you. I wouldn't if I could, and on this subject I can't. We aren't looking for any votes out of the Mississippi Congress. <laughs> now having said that, I want to say this. That does not absolve you from the responsibility of deluging those congressmen with letters asking for repeal of 14B. You may say, what's the use? a whole lot of use. It's a little subtle, but not too subtle for a group of this kind, if you'll just think about it for a moment. You have to build for the future. If you're going to have an effective program of political action, which is the foundation upon which we build a legislative program, then you're going to have to have the members of our unions understand something about the political process and the legislative process. And there isn't anything that's going to teach them any quicker than to have a member go to all of the trouble, and it isn't easy for a lot of our members, to sit down and write his congressman and ask him to do something and then have the congressman not do it. They're going to resent the fact that the congressman gave them that kind of treatment. And they're going to be that much more willing to do something in the next political campaign. They're more apt to become active supporters of your COPE program. 
and they'll begin to understand some of the realities of the political life. And if those congressmen get enough votes, enough letters, and when the voting rights bill becomes effective, if Mississippi starts voting in the kind of numbers that they should be voting in, instead of voting 30% of the potential, you start voting 70 and 80% of your attention, uh, uh, potential, either these congressmen are going to change their minds or you're going to have some new congressmen. And that's why I say that you should not let these things go on, these letters to the editor go unanswered. Get your own letters into the editor. You should not let these editorials go unanswered. Get your own answers in, in the form of a letter to the editor. You can't write his editorial. And let your congressman know that the labor people of Mississippi want that 14 be repealed just as much as anybody else. And then you'll begin to get the kind of reaction out of your people that's going to do something for the years ahead. Now we've been working at this a long time, a lot of us. Some of, some of you are a lot younger than some of the rest of us. But uh, times some of us think that we aren't making any progress. But really, if we're honest with ourselves, when we look back over the last 20 or 30 years at what has happened, we can see that we really are making progress, no matter how slow it seems. And we have to keep working for the future so that uh, our children and our children's children can reap some of the benefit that we have reaped by the blood, sweat, and tears of those who went before us in this great labor movement. And that's why I say that even though we don't expect a single congressman in Mississippi, nor either of your senators, to vote uh, for the repeal of 14B, don't let them think that there isn't anybody here that wants it. That would be the most serious mistake you could make. <laughs> well, that leads me to one final point that I want to make. And that is this. I have used the phrase many times talking to groups of this kind and in conventions, that in the kind of a, an industrial society that we have in this country today, in which three quarters of the people live in urban centers, not on the farm, in the kind of conditions that we have to contend with today, that collective bargaining alone is no longer enough. More and more we are dependent upon legislation. Legislation at the state level and legislation at the national level to help us solve some of the great social problems that we and economic problems that we are faced with. And there is going to be greater and greater reliance on the legislative process. And uh, the legislative process will produce the kind of results you want only if you've done the job at the ballot box before the legislature goes into session. Because the kind of men and women you elect to office determine the kind of laws you get and the way the laws are going to be enforced after you get them. Many a good law has been gutted by bad enforcement. And so I say that lab the labor movement, there's no turning back on this. We're going to be more and more involved in political action and in legislation in the years ahead than we have ever been before. And that's where our state labor councils our city, central, city and county labor councils come into the picture. 
because these are the agencies through which the labor movement must act in terms of political action and legislation. These are the agencies which the labor movement has established for that purpose. COPE is a committee of the state labor council or the city council can, or county council. COPE is only the political arm of the central body. And if we're going to be effective in the kind of thing I'm talking about, then we must strengthen these state and local branches of the labor movement. We were looking at some of the figures at the executive board meeting yesterday. You have about 121 local unions affiliated with the Mississippi State Air Guard Corps. There are about 200 that are not affiliated. Some of them for one reason, some for another, and none of them for a good reason. Now you represent the leadership of the labor movement in this state. And I would presume that most of your locals are affiliated. I hope my presumption is correct. But you have a responsibility when you go back to your community to start working on those locals that are not affiliated, either with the state or with your local council. Because this is the source of our strength. And we're fighting these battles with one arm tied behind us when you have this kind of an affiliation situation. Now, I don't underestimate this problem. And in Mississippi, it has certain aspects to it that it doesn't have in some of the other states. But even in those states, we have this problem. And there's a sad lack of understanding on the part of many of our local unions as to what their responsibility is to the labor movement. Yes, we demand repeal of 14D so that we can legalize a union shop, and then we insist on being free riders on the backs of the labor movement ourselves by not affiliating with the, the state federations and the city councils. What kind of uh, logic and reason is that? And you're the ones that are going to have to do the missionary work on these unions. There's a big woodworkers local down here at Laurel. Doesn't affiliate. Why? They ought to be affiliated. This organization is fighting their battle on many fronts. There are 200 others that are not affiliated. Why? This needs to be found out needs to be forthcoming, and you're the ones that are going to have to do the missionary work. This is the sum and substance of my message. As I said in the beginning, I only have one speech. I may use different words as I go along, but this is what I'm talking about. Build a labor movement so that we can do a job for the people of Mississippi and of America. Thank you very much.
Mississippi is largely due to the increase in the minimum wage from 75 cents to a dollar. This is where the personal capital increase came from. Strangely enough, the same people, the Koch owners of right to work, are the same people that continue to fight an increase in minimum wage. And you might want to know them well. Bill, you said you had a comment? got to start, and not that you didn't tell this, Sam, but we've got to start answering these blame damned letters to the editor that are not written by the people who sign them. And the same Jackson Daily Liar and Claire and Era is sharing canned editorials right out of the National Right to Work Committee, the Farm Bureau, Mississippi Economic Council, and I looked for the next few days for that jackass on the lower left-hand corner of the Daily Liar to start taking out after us. In talking about letters to congressmen, I would want to point out this. We in this history of, genera of uh, mankind are living in the fastest changing time ever. And that's proper. We're faster than the preceding one. Uh, and I think that's been the history throughout mankind. From the two-room house to the blue-room out back, three room houses with two baths, uh, from the horse and buggy to the point where an Ed White walked from the west coast of California to just beyond Bermuda in 20 minutes this week through space, uh, from the Atwater Kent earphone battery operated crystal radio to modern television, these are fast changing times, so we ain't seen nothing yet till this Mississippi congressional delegation when the organized labor workers finally unite, not organize, but unite, and with whether we like it or not, the voting rights bill is enacted and some of the groups quit, quit agitating and start registering people. You ain't never seen Jim Eastman, John Stennis, and those people change. That's going to be the fastest change in time. They're going to be the greatest going to get many different ones, but the ones we've got is going to take a different outlook, is evident. And I'd like to call on our good friends from the 1st Congressional District, please. I wrote a much too long epistle to, to all of these BASTRDS from Mississippi who are in Washington. And I told them about these canned editorials, taking the emotional pick on right to work, right to work, 14B, and to make it, it had to be a simple for me to argue reasonable with them, see, about the right of contract basis when you buy a house or a refrigerator or an automobile. And that uh, this thing goes to the heart of the Constitution. Now, you don't hear them talking about that. But it's been long established that commerce is a matter which the federal government has jurisdiction over. And labor is recognized as a part of commerce and covered by the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. Talk to any good objective constitutional lawyer and he'll tell you 14B is all wet. Now, when we talk about the right, they talk about the compulsion. Compulsion, compulsion what? Anybody has got to meet the requirements of the employer who wants to hire him. The telephone company right now is just trying all over this state to find some qualified Negroes, but they can't meet their qualifications. They can't even find a lot of our educated white people, girl with 
two-year college student meets their qualifications. Rights of work are not you. You've got to meet the employer's standards, whatever he wants. And that's the way it's going to be. Rights of work are not. And they talk about the compulsion of paying dues and all that. And you know, I paid taxes to the city of Jackson, and they ain't never elected anybody up there that run the thing the way I want to run it. I don't ever go to the attend the council meetings because I'm, I don't believe in what they're doing. I don't like the way they're spending the money, and there ain't nothing I can do about it because I'm a minority, along with other people. Legislature the same way, and this Board of Supervisors, my God, with them. But a union, they lose sight of a union, and I argue this with these guys, that a union comes into existence as a result of a majority. And we, this country is operated based on the pretense of a majority rule, even though Walter Sellers and his minority run things in Mississippi. But majority rule, a majority of the employees have got to go to a union to get volunteer recognition from an employer. A majority of them has got to want a union before John Liebus will certify. And then we get rights, of, we get union security or union jobs as a result of a majority of those. And that's the way we operate our government. And if those people don't like it, there's no compulsion. They can go anywhere else. I can move out of the city of Jackson. If there was somewhere else I could move. Now, I, I say this, and I take that kind of approach to you, that I'm almost floored at a letter I got from Tom Abernathy today. Now, after he, he tells me all about the reasons he first voted for 14 uh, Taft-Hartley, which included 14B, and what a great and glorious industrial section northeast Mississippi is, he will. He did take time to read this epistle, and well, he I says this on, on June the second. Uh, this will acknowledge receipt and convey thanks for your letter of May the 29th. I am pleased to have your views regarding Section 14B. You have raised some interesting questions and made some good points. I shall certainly consider your views. He didn't shut the door. He didn't leave it open very much. But, and I'm looking for a good excuse to take off about a week and get drunk. And I want my brothers and sisters from northeast Mississippi, if, if they will, from the amalgamating, the rubber workers, and the partners, and all the rest, the IBW, let's deluge this guy with letters. All the rest of them, but let's pick on this guy. He might get up some morning because they're going to vote and his office ain't bothering him and he ain't hung over, and he just might slip up and vote for it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Go ahead, Brother Nietzsche. I'm sure I'll make the motion too far to find out, but let me let the gentleman have the floor and I'll talk to him. I would like to announce the appreciation follow Bill Stanley. So I'm I'm glad to uh, I'm glad to follow you, Bill. I want to uh, congratulate you on that success. Now, <coughs> Brother Smith went in very uh, capably to this uh, business of legislation. 
They have two nice-looking fellas in the back of the room, Brother Mullins and Brother Smith, to take uh, out some sample letters we have. Now, you'll note on this uh, sheet, uh, letters to the editor to be used only as a guide. Now, I know we've all noted these editorials and letters to the editor opposing repeal of rights of way. I think some of you should sit down and take a few minutes and write some letters to the editor. And I want to repeat, please do not copy these. Use them just as ideas only. Then on the other page, we have a couple of sample letters to congressmen or senators. Now, please don't copy this. As I said, these are to be used only as a guide. And I, too, want to urge you to get busy and to go back to your local union and to encourage every member to write to their congressman and the two senators. As you have already been told, it's doubtful if we get any votes, but we shouldn't sit back and not write these fellows because it's going to be a day of reckoning, and we need to be on record. We need to have these answers. There, some of you will get answers. Others won't. We need to have these letters for record. So if Brother Mullins and Brother Smith will please uh, pass these out, we are hopeful that they will be of some assistance to you in this campaign. We're talking about uh, communication on 14B particularly. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to attempt to make a talk on affiliation with this organization because I think Brother Smith very eloquently stressed the importance. Well, let me say that if you are here this afternoon and your local union is not affiliated with the Mississippi AFL-CIO, you don't have no excuse because I'm going to put somebody at the door with these affiliation blanks and you may not be able to get out without affiliating. Now, in all seriousness, brothers and sisters, this organization is charged with tremendous responsibility. And this organization can only implement its program, can only go as far in representing you and trying to establish a better way of life for the people in the AFL-CIO and the people in Mississippi as we can get support to do so. Brother Smith told you we have some 200 local unions in this state, not to mention some of the real small ones, that are not affiliated with this organization. And ladies and gentlemen, you know as well as I do that those locals are not happy to do the job, not that Tom Knight thinks ought to be done, but the job that's got to be done, plain, everyday fact. Consider this thing, and if you are not here, I urge you to go back to your location and to contact the offices of these local unions and see if you can't encourage these people to affiliate with this organization if you are not here. Brother, Brother Ramsey, of course, has already expressed our appreciation. I feel that I should. Office of State Council express our appreciation for your interest in some of the problems that we face and the problems that we are going to solve. I know these things. As I've said many times, in this labor movement in Mississippi, we have some of the finest talent there is in this union. The only thing wrong is that we just hadn't used that talent. We hadn't coordinated our comes right back to this business of affiliation. You can pursue any angle, any of our problems, and it comes right back to the fact that we hadn't all been in there working together like we should have been. Now, one announcement. I'm going to jump to it. <laughs> I think I say this is all right. Immediately after that joint, I want you to know this, Brother Ramsey. Brother E.L. Barnes, the chairman of the fifth section of this church board, asked me to announce that he would like to see the members of the board of that organization in this room immediately after the joint. Now, you people that are members of our board know who you are. And you international representatives that represent organizations that are local in that district, don't forget that you are part of that executive board. So if you'll please meet with